top tip for success while using these videos? Please pause the video and attempt the question first before you view the explanations or solutions. Four typical exam questions you can expect in paper one for solving equations will normally be in question one. The four typical exam questions are factorization, where we either do the common factor, the difference between two squares or a trinomial. We can ask you one using the quadratic formula, an equation with roots, and then an inequality. Remember, inequality is an equation that has a bigger than or a smaller than sign in. So if we look at the last few years' papers, we're going to start on November 2018. Ask me to solve for x. Question 1.1.1. They've given us x squared minus 4x plus 3 equals 0. This equation is already in standard form, which means it says equals 0. And I can factorize this. This is a trinomial. If I factorize my trinomial, my brackets are x minus 3 and x minus 1 equals 0, which means x was equal to 3 or x was equal to 1. Those are my two solutions. You would have seen that this question, they allocated three marks to this question. So the three marks, it is a mark for the factorization and a mark for each of the answers. Grade 12s, if you are struggling to factorize a trinomial like in this way, you are welcome to use the quadratic formula. We will be looking at the quadratic formula in the next question. Just remember, you do have to show your substitution. Question 1.1.2. We are given 5x squared minus 5x plus 1 equals 0. It's already in standard form. If you look at this at first glance, you might think it's a trinomial. But there is a clue on the paper. It says correct to two decimal places. So you must know immediately that I have to use the quadratic formula. Whenever they say correct to two decimal places in question one, quadratic formula. What is my quadratic formula? X equals negative B plus minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC everything over 2A. Just a reminder, how do I know what's A, B, and C? A is the value in front of the x squared. B is by x, and C is the one with no x's. You do have to show your substitution. So if I substitute in, it's minus. B is negative 5, so in a bracket, negative 5. Always substitute in the bracket, please. Plus minus. Negative 5 squared minus 4, our A value is 5, and C is 1. Everything over 2 times A is 5. And I'm going to get two solutions for X. And now I need to go to my calculator. So if I go to my calculator, fraction sign, and I'm going to go minus in a bracket negative 5 plus square root of negative 5 in a bracket squared, and I type it in exactly like it's in the equation, minus 4 times 5 times 1, everything over 2, and A was 5. And it gives me my answer in a fraction. Remember, your question paper said correct to two decimal places. So you press the SD button, and you get 0, comma, two decimal places, 7, 2. So my first answer is 0, 0,72. Now I can press back on my calculator. And I did the plus first before the square root sign. So now I'm going to change that to the minus option. Once again, it's in a fraction. Press my SD button. Be careful of your rounding here. That will become 0, 0,28. And there is my solution. Once again, three marks. Where did the three marks go? Showing the substitution and then for each of the answers. Question 1.1.3. They've given us x squared minus 3x minus 10 is greater than 0. This is an inequality. If you look at it, it's already in standard form. So I can factorize it. That is a trinomial. If I factorize it, it's x minus 5 and x plus 2. 
greater than zero. Now, grade 12 is very important. Please write down your critical values. With an inequality, we have to write down our critical values. Remember, if I had to do a visual representation, this would have been a parabola. So where would my x-intercepts of my parabola have been? It would have been at x equals 5 or at x equals negative 2. This is not your solution. This is if I had to draw the parabola where my x-intercepts would have been. That's why they're called my critical values. So if I go and draw my parabola, where would my two x-intercepts have been? At 5, I'm just going to do a rough sketch and negative 2. Happy or sad parabola? Happy parabola. And there is my sketch, my visual representation of my parabola. What does this question ask? This question asks, where is this greater or equal to zero? So I'm looking for the arm above the x-axis on the left and the arm above the x-axis on the right. So how do I now write, up, write down my answers? It is all the x's smaller than which value? Negative 2. So it's the x's smaller than negative 2. Very important, or. We never use and with this question. It is or. Or, because they are separate. The x is bigger than which value? 5. Or the x is bigger than 5. Do I need an equal underneath? Check your original equation. No. Great 12, you are welcome to write it in any of the notations you would like. Remember, you can also say it is from negative infinity to negative 2. Please remember round brackets. It's not equal. And from 5 to positive infinity. Either of the notations is acceptable. This was also a three mark question. So where did the marks go? Factorizing the trinomial. And then for each of the answers in either notation. Question 1.1.4. They've given us 3 square root x equals x minus 4. So this is an equation with a square root in it. The way we deal with this is we square both sides. So you have to square both sides of the equation. You have to square the left and you have to square the right. Very important to remember, please, that the square root belongs to the 3 and to the square. The square belongs to the 3 and the square root of x. 3 squared is 9. The square root of x squared is x. Tip, remember, there's a middle term when you multiply out the brackets. If you're scared, you're going to forget it. Please rather write the brackets out twice and then multiply them out. So if I multiply out my brackets, it's x squared minus 4x minus 4x plus 16. And now I have to write it in standard form. I am going to write it in standard form and I get x squared minus 4x minus 4x minus 9x gives me minus 17x plus 16. And now I can factorize. Once again, it's a trinomial. So I get x minus 1 and x minus 16, which means what is my two solutions for x? x could have been 1 or x could have been 16. Grade 12s, this is the only question where you have to test your answers. So whenever there's a square root and you've squared both sides, this is the only type of sum where you have to test your answers. So how do I test my answer? I take the left-hand side of the equation and I see if I get the same as the right-hand side. So I'm going to start with the left-hand side. The left-hand side is 3 square root x, and I'm going to test x equals 1 first. So 3 times the square root of 1. Square root of 1 is 1 times 3 is 3. If I do that on the right-hand side, my equation was x minus 4. So if I go substitute in 1, 1 minus 4, I get negative 3. That is not the same answer. So x could not have been 1. Test the other one as well. Do not assume it. So if I go to the left-hand side, I'm now going to test 16. 3, the square root of x. Substitute in 16. 3, the square root of 16. That's 4. 4 times 3 is 12. Right-hand side. 
x minus 4. If x was 16, 16 minus 4 is 12. That is the same answer, so 16 works. This question counted four marks. Where did the four marks go? The first mark went for squaring both sides. Then you got a mark for multiplying out and writing it in standard form. The next mark was for factorization. And the final mark was for both answers, but also having that x was not equal to 1. So the final mark, you had to have x not equal to 1 and then x equal to 16. 2019, first question. Solve for x, x squared plus 5x minus 6. You will see it's a trinomial again. It's exactly the same as 2018. 1.1.2. 1 .1 4x squared plus 3x minus 5 equals 0. Already in standard form. They say correct to two decimal places. So we know it's going to be a quadratic. I'm going to use the quadratic formula to solve that one. One point one point three. It is an inequality. It says four x squared minus one smaller than zero. Yes, it's an inequality. The right now is a difference. The left is a difference between two squares. So that will be two x plus one and two x minus one smaller than zero. My critical values, remember, not equal, critical values because if I represent this visually, it's a parabola. So where would my x-intercepts be? It's where 2x plus 1 is equal to 0. So x is negative a half. Or 2x minus 1 equals 0. So x is equal a half. So let's go do the visual representation so we can see how this parabola looks. Okay, my x-intercepts is at negative a half and a half. Happy or sad parabola? Happy one? It is just the rough sketch, just so I can have a visual representation. What are they looking for now? They're now looking for smaller than zero. So that is the section beneath the x-axis. So it's all the way, all the x's from a half to, from negative a half to a half. So it's all the x's greater than negative a half, smaller than a half. Do I need an equal underneath? No. Remember, you could have used any notation you like, so you can say it's from negative a half to a half. Just remember round brackets, please. Now you will see also three marks. Where do the three marks go? One mark for factorization. In 2019, they gave a mark for showing your method how you got there. So it's always important that you show your method because you never know where the mark is going to be allocated. And the third mark was for the answer. If we look at the 2020 paper, first question for 2020, they're giving me, for the first time, not a trinomial like the previous two years, They're asking me x squared minus 6x equals 0, and that is a common factor. So if you take out your x, it's x, and the bracket is x minus 6 equals 0, which means x is equal to 0, or x is equal to 6. You see it only counts two marks, a mark for the factorization and a mark for both answers. 1.1.2, x squared plus 10x plus 8 equals 0. Once again, our clue is there, correct to two decimal places, quadratic formula. 1.1.3, once again an inequality, but it's already in brackets, it's already factorized. The first bracket is 1 minus x, and the other bracket is x minus 2, smaller than 0. So they've already factorized it for you. So my critical values, where would my x-intercepts be? It's where 1 minus x equals 0, so x is equal to 1. Or where x plus 2 is equal to 0, so x is equal to negative 2. So if I want to do the visual representation of this parabola, I know the intercepts are at 1 and at negative 2. But I need to determine which way my parabola goes. 
So I can multiply out the brackets to see what the original equation was. 1 times x is x. 1 times 2 is 2x. If I continue multiplying out, I get negative x squared minus 2x. Sorry, that was supposed to be a 2 smaller than 0. If I then add up my like terms, I get negative x squared minus x plus 2 smaller than 0. And I can see this is supposed to be a sad parabola. So it runs like that. What are they looking for? They are looking for where it is smaller than zero, so beneath the x-axis. So it's the arm coming down to the left and the arm going down to the right, which means it's all the x's smaller than what x value? Negative 2. So it's the x's smaller than negative 2. Remember, always or. The x's greater than what x value? 1. The x is greater than 1. There is your answer. You could have done any of the notations. Just remember, round brackets, please, for this scenario. So between negative infinity and negative 2, and then from 1 to positive infinity. Where did they allocate the marks for the three marks? It was a mark in this one in 2020, 2020 to determine the critical values. Then they gave a mark for the method and a mark for the final answer. So you see every year the marks shift a little bit. Please make sure you do show all your work. Question 1.1.4. It is once again an equation with a third in it. How do I deal with this again? I've got a square root. I've got to square both sides. So I'm going to square the left and the right. A square root and a square cancels, so it's x plus 18. Be safe and write the bracket out twice so you do not forget the middle term. And then you can multiply out your brackets. So that's x squared minus 2x minus 2x plus 4. Next step is to write it in standard form. So that gives us x squared minus 5x minus 14. And now I have to factorize. If I factorize my trinomial, my brackets are x minus 7 and x plus 2. You are welcome to use the quadratic formula if you struggle factorizing normally. Just remember to show your substitution, which means x could have been 7 or x could have been negative 2. I have to remember to test the solution. It's the only question where I've got to test my solutions. So let's go test. Left hand side, square root of x plus 18, I'm going to test 7 first. Square root of 7 plus 18 is 25, square root of 25 is 5. Right hand side, x minus 2. So 7 minus 2 equals 5. Both answers equal to 5. That works. So, test the other one. What if x was 2? Square root of x plus 18. I'm going to substitute in my negative 2 plus 18. That's 16. Square root of 16 is 4. Right hand side is x minus 2. So, if I go negative 2 minus 2, I get negative 4. Not the same answer, so no, x minus 2 was not a solution. So I draw a line through, it's not a solution. Where did the marks go in this question? You'll see this time in 2020, this question counted five marks, when in the previous years it was four marks. So where are they allocating their marks? A mark for squaring both sides, multiplying out your brackets, and getting it into standard form. A mark for factorizing, if you used your quadratic formula there, it would be for the substitution. Then you got one mark for both answers, and you got another mark because you said x was not equal to negative 2. That's where our five marks went. In 2021, if we look at the paper, first question, it looks exactly the same like 2018 and 2019. It's a trinomial to factorize. 1.1.2, 1 
We're going to use our quadratic formula to factorize and get the solutions. 1.1.3 looks a little bit different. They've given me x squared plus 5x, small or equal to negative 4. How is it different from the previous three years? The previous three years, it was already a 0. So we have to write it in standard form first. So please make sure you write it in standard form first. So it says small or equal to 0. And then you can factorize your trinomial and go on from there. 1.1.4, once again, the same as the previous years. We square both sides and we remember to test our solution. So solving simultaneous equations will appear in question one of paper one. If we look at November 2018, they asked me to solve simultaneously for x and y. They give me two equations. 3x minus y equals 2. And the second equation they give me is 2y plus 9x squared equals negative 1. The way we approach these equations is we take one of them and we change the subject of the formula, which means I'm going to pick one of these two equations and I'm either going to make it say x equals or y equals. It is my choice. I'm going to take the first equation and I'm going to make it say y equals, which means it will be 3x minus 2 equals y. So I've changed the subject of my formula, so it says y equals. Why did I pick the y in this scenario instead of the x? I could have done the x, but then I would have ended up with a fraction, and I'm avoiding the fractions to make my life a little bit easier. I'm going to number that equation number 1 and the other one equation number 2. Second step is to substitute equation 1 into equation number 2. What does that mean? You're going to look at equation number two, and everywhere you see a y, you are going to substitute or replace it with 3x minus 2. So what does equation two say? 2y. So instead of y in a bracket, remember when we do substitution, you do it in a bracket. 3x minus 2, continuing, plus 9x squared minus equals negative 1. Why did I do this? Because now my equation only has one variable in and I can solve it. So let's start solving it. First going to multiply out the brackets. 6x minus 4 plus 9x squared equals negative 1. Write it in standard form. So that's 9x squared plus 6x minus 3 equals 0. And now I've got an equation in standard form that I can factorize. I'm going to divide everything by 3 first, so I get 3x squared plus 2x minus 1. That trinomial is just a bit easier to factorize. If I factorize it, my brackets are 3x minus 1 and x plus 1 equals 0. Grade 12s, remember if you're struggling to factorize trinomials like this, you are welcome to use the quadratic formula. You just have to show your substitution, please. So that means x could have been a third, or x could have been negative 1. Go read your sum and double check that you have actually complete, finished the sum. It says solve for x, solve simultaneously for x and y. We are not done. We've only solved for x. Remember, we have to get y as well. How can I get y? You take your answer and you substitute it into one of your original equations. Tip is take the equation that's the easiest. So I'm going to take equation 1. So I'm going to go y equals 3. What if x was a third? So I'm going to sub in a third first. 3 times a third minus 2. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Remember, we worked out x could have been a third or negative 1. So you must also work out what could y have been if x was negative 1. Same story. 3 times negative 1 I'm subbing in now, minus 2. Minus 3 minus 2 is negative 5. And there is my solution. So where did the mark go? This was a 6 mark question. The first mark goes for changing the subject of the formula, whether you picked y equals or x equals. Then a mark for substitution, getting it into standard form. A mark for factorizing. One mark for both the x solutions and one mark for both the 
Y solutions. Six marks in total. If we look to November 2019, on November 2019, you'll see it's the same type of thing, except there's one little difference. I'm just going to work through it with you. Solve simultaneously for X and Y. So they have given me that y plus x equals 12. And the second one they've given me is xy equals 14 minus 3x. What's my first step again? Change the subject of the formula. I can pick which equation I'm doing, and I can also pick if I'm making it x equals or y equals. If I look at the first one, my choice if I'm going to make it y or x equal, I'm going to go y again. So y equals 12 minus x, equation 1 and equation 2. Second step, substitution. I'm going to sub equation 1 into equation 2. What does that mean again? In equation 2, everywhere I see a y, I'm now going to replace the y with what? 12 minus x. So how would it look? It would look x bracket for my substitution in the bracket i'm replacing the y with 12 minus x equals 14 minus 3x and now we're exactly where we were with the previous sum multiply out your brackets solve your equation and remember to also calculate your y values if we go to november 2020 you will see it's exactly the same thing you can pick whether you want to make the first equation equal x equal or y equal. Your choice where you change the subject of the formula. You substitute in, you solve, and remember to also work out the other variable. November 2021, same story. They tell me solve x and y in the following equations. The only thing in November 2021 They've given me 2y equals 3 plus x, and they've given me in the second equation 2xy plus 7 equals x squared plus 4y squared. If you change the subject of the formula, in this case, I would have made the first equation say x equal, just so I did not have to divide by the 2 in front of the y and deal with a fraction. So I would say 2y minus 3 equals x. So I would have made x the subject of my formula, equation 1 and equation 2. If you do your substitution, equation 1 into equation 2, this means what am I replacing now? I'm now going to replace x. So everywhere I see an x in the second equation, I'm going to replace it. So how would my equation look? I would say 2y and then do my substitution. What am I substituting x with? With 2y minus 3. So in the bracket, 2y minus 3 plus 7 equals, instead of x squared, in a bracket, squared, what are you replacing x with? 2y minus 3 and then plus 4y squared. Now you can multiply out and solve for y in this case, and then remember just to go back and also solve for x. Following formulas you need to learn. These formulas do not appear on the formula sheet. The first term of a second difference is equal to 2a. The first term of a first difference is equal to 3a plus b. And the first term of the original pattern is equal to a plus b plus c. The nth term of a quadratic number pattern is given by tn equals an squared plus bn plus c. Just a reminder, grade 12s, these do not appear on the formula sheet. You need to know them. So, if we look at a quadratic number pattern, it is formed when the second differences of a sequence is, const, is a constant value. So, if I give you the number pattern 5, 18, 35, 56, and I subtract 18 from 5, we get 13. 35 from 18 is 17. And continuing like that, we get 21, 25, and 29. If I now subtract 17 from 13, we get 4. 21 from 7 also gives me 4. These are called our second differences. As you can see, 
second difference is constant, therefore it is a quadratic sequence. The number pattern 13, 17, 21, 25, 29 is called the first differences. The first differences always forms a linear number pattern or an arithmetic sequence. So what did we have to learn our formulas? The second difference, 2a is equal to 4. The first term of the first difference, 3a plus b will be equal to 13. And the first term of the original series, a plus b plus c will be equal to 5. So now I can do my calculations. We start and we work from the bottom up. So we start with the second difference. 2a is equal to 4, which means a is equal to 2. Moving up, I can say 3a plus b is equal to 13. I now know from my pre previous calculation that a is 2. So I can calculate that b is equal to 7. Then for my final one, I, a plus b plus c must be equal to 5. I have a is 2. I have b is 7. So I can substitute it in and calculate that c is negative 4. So our final one, always remember to finish off by giving the general term. tn equals 2n squared plus 7n minus 4. Now you must remember 2n squared plus 7n minus 4. If you had to do a graphical representation of that formula, it would be a parabola. This would be a happy parabola, which means it has a minimum value. So let's go look at some past papers. If we look at November 2019, they've given us the quadratic sequence. Three hundred and twenty one, two hundred and ninety, two hundred and sixty one, and two hundred and thirty four. Very important, they said this is a quadratic sequence. First question write down the values of the next two terms of the sequence. So you now need to know what are they adding or subtracting the whole time. So let's go work out the first difference two hundred and ninety minus three hundred and twenty one gives me negative 31. 261 minus 290 is negative 29. 234 minus 261 is negative 27. So what would be the next one? If I look, remember we said the first differences make an arithmetic series or a linear. Negative 31, negative 29, negative 27. So next would be negative 25. So if you subtract 25, our next number in the sequence would be 209. And then if I subtract 23 from 209, the next one would be 186. That question you see counted two marks. It is one mark for each of the answers. So one mark for each of your answers. Question 2.1.2. Determine the general term of the sequence in the form tn equals an squared plus bn plus c. Please remember you do have to show all your work and calculations. So if I write my sequence down again and I start by subtracting. We said 290 minus 321 is negative 31. 261 minus 290 is negative 29. 234 minus 261 is negative 27. Remember, that's our first differences. They said this is quadratic, so we know the second differences must be constant. So let's go do it again. Negative 29 minus negative 31 gives me 2. Negative 27 minus negative 29 gives me 2. My second difference is constant. From our formula we had to learn, we start from the bottom up. We know 2a is equal to 2. So we're going to start with a first. 2a is equal to 2, which means a is equal to 1. If I start with the first term of my first differences, I know that is 3a plus b must be equal to negative 31. So 3 times a plus b equals negative 31. I just calculated a was 1, so I can substitute it in. And B works out to be negative 34. 
going to my final one. Remember, we're working from the bottom up. A plus B plus C will give me the first term of the original series. So A plus B plus C must be equal to 321. We calculated A was 1, so we can substitute it in. We know B is negative 34, so we can substitute that in. Plus C will give me 321. And C works out to be 354. So what is our final formula? Tn equals, remember the formula said An squared plus Bn plus C. So A was 1, so that's N squared. B is negative 34, so negative 34 in, and then C is plus 354. Where did they allocate the marks? You'll see it's four marks. It is a mark for calculating up until the second difference, then a mark for calculating A, for B, and for C, and that gives me my four marks. 2.1.3. Which term or terms of the sequence will have a value of 74? So they want to know where is this term values equal to 74. So you take your formula, n squared minus 34 in plus 354, and I must make it equal to 74. And now I've got an equation. Remember, to solve equations, we must write them in standard form first. So n squared minus 34 in plus 280 equals zero. And now I've got a trinomial that I can factorize. You can either factorize your trinomial normally. If you're struggling with that, remember you are allowed to use the quadratic formula, but you must show your substitution. If I factorize my trinomial, my two brackets are n minus 40, 14 and n minus 20 equals zero, which means n is 14 or n could have been 20. Now remember, n stands for the term position, which means at term number 14, I'll get 74, and at term number 20, I will get 74. Why am I having two answers that works? Because if I take my formula, my quadratic equation, and I represent it graphically, we said we will get a parabola. That's why you have two. Just a note here, remember, n can never be a negative number. You cannot have a negative amount of terms. So if you got negative 20 here, then you had to say that one was not applicable. In this case, both are positive, so both work. This was a four mark question. So where did the four marks go? For setting up your equation, then for writing it in standard form, and then for each of your answers. 2.1.4. They're asking me which term in the sequence has the least value. The least value is another way of asking the minimum value. Remember, we've now said a few times that a quadratic number pattern, if I have to represent this graphically, would be a parabola. Would this be a happy or a sad parabola? It would be a happy parabola. So I'm looking for the minimum value. So I'm looking for the turning point. In this case, Remember when we did parabolas, we talked about the x value of the turning point. Now we're looking for the n. So how would I calculate this? I would say when we did parabolas, we said x equals negative b over 2a. But we're not working with the x in our equation. We're working with the n. So n is negative b over 2a. What is b again? 34. So it's negative, negative 34 over 2, our a value is 1. So that gives me an answer of 70. There was a different method to do this. You could have used, remember, we've done calculus, and we now know from calculus that turning points, we can calculate them. It's where the first derivative is equal to 0. So you could have said, I know the formula, tn is n squared minus 34n plus 354. To get a turning point, I know that's where the first derivative is equal to 0. So what would my first derivative be? 2n minus 34 would be equal to 0, which means 2n is equal to 34, and n is equal to 70. Two ways to get the same answer. This question counted two marks. 
it was a mark for showing your substitution and a mark for your answer. If you use the second method, it was a mark for the first derivative equal to zero and then a mark for your answer. November 2020. They gave me the number pattern and very important to read. They said it's a quadratic number pattern and they gave me negative 3, 6, 27 and 60. The first question, determine the general term of this number pattern in the form tn equals an squared plus bn plus c. Okay, we know it's quadratic. We know we're going to have to get a second difference. So let's start. 6 minus negative 3 gives me 9. 27 minus 6 is 21. 60 minus 27 is 33. Remember, that's my first difference. I need my second difference to be constant. 21 minus 9, so I do it again, is 12. And 33 minus 21 is 12. Starting from the bottom up, 2a will be equal to my second difference, which is 12, so I can calculate that. 2a is 12, which means a is 6. What is the value of my first term of my first difference is equal to again? 3a plus b should give me 9. I do know now from my previous calculation that a is 6, so I can substitute that in. And I can calculate my b value. b works out to be negative 9. Working from my last step up, my first term of my original series is equal to a plus b plus c. So a plus b plus c equals negative 3. a we calculated was 6. b we calculated was negative 9. Plus c equals negative 3, so c calculates to be 0. So what is our formula? tn equals 6n squared minus 9n, I do not have to write plus 0. Once again, 4 marks. Where did the 4 marks go? For calculating up until the second difference, for calculating a, b, and c. 2.2.2. Calculate the value of the 50th term of this pattern. So now be careful, in 2019, they asked you, ask you where would the pattern be equal to? Now they're asking you to calculate the value of the 50th term, which means you have your formula and you're going to go substitute in 50. So 6 times 50 squared minus 9 times 50. And our answer works out to be 14,550. Once again, two marks, a mark for showing your substitution and a mark for your answer. 2.2.3. Show, and this is one where you've got to read very um, carefully, show that the sum of the first n first differences of this pattern can be given by the formula Sn equals 6n squared plus 3n. So they are referring to the sum. Now remember, we don't work out the sum of a quadratic number pattern. We work out the sum. We've got some formulas for an arithmetic and a geometric. So they say, show that the sum of the first in first differences. So they're only referring to the first differences. Where is the first difference again? There's our first differences. So they're referring to the sequence 9, 21, 33. I must go get the sum formula for that sequence. Okay. What sequence is that again? That is an arithmetic sequence. How do I know? 21 minus 9 is 12. 33 minus 21 is 12. And we also know the first difference of a quadratic sequence is always an arithmetic. Okay, we have a formula. Sn equals n over 2, bracket 2a, plus n minus 1 times d. What do we know? What is the a value? Write it down for yourself. a is our first term, which is 9. d, what is my com... Um, common difference the whole time, D is 12. So now I can substitute in. Sn equals N over 2. 2 times A is 9. 
plus I don't know n, n minus 1, remember to put the d in a bracket as well, please, times 12. If we now multiply out, that's 18 plus 12 n minus 12, add up my like terms. So that is 6 plus 12 n inside the bracket. And if I now multiply in the n over 2, 2 goes into 6 3 times, and 3 times n is 3 n. 2 goes into 12 6 times, 6 n times n is 6 n squared. Is that what they asked? Exactly. So where did the marks go? It was one mark for the a and the d values, a mark for showing your substitution, and then a mark up until the second last step. Why did they not give a mark for the last step? Because the answer is on the question paper. Now, grade 12s, what if the examiner took this exact same question and they went and changed it up a little bit and they gave you the sequence, negative 3, they didn't give you the 6, they gave you an x, then a 27, and then a 16. And they told you it was a quadratic sequence and you had to go and calculate the value of x. The important part is they told you it was quadratic which means you know what about a quadratic? The second differences are the same. So we start the same way. We start by saying x minus, and remember you're subtracting negative 3. The next one would have been 27 minus x. And my third one would be 60 minus 27 is 33. Then I have to do it a second time because that's my first differences. Just remember, a negative and a negative makes a positive. So now I would go 27 minus x minus, that becomes x plus 3. And then on the second one, 33 minus, don't forget the brackets, 27 minus x. What do you know about the second differences? The second differences have to be equal. So I know I can set up an equation now. So I can say 27 minus x minus x plus 3 must be equal to 33 minus, in brackets, 27 minus x. And now I can solve this. 27 minus x minus x minus 3 equals 33 minus 27 plus x. That means negative 3x is equal to negative 18. And that means x is equal to 6. So I was able to calculate that that original x value was supposed to be 6. Now, grade 12, remember we do receive a formula sheet. Some of these formulas appear on the formula sheet. I don't tell you which one is for the arithmetic and which one's for the geometric. So we should know these. On our formula sheet, the general term for an arithmetic sequence is tn equals a plus n minus 1d, and the sum formula is n over 2, bracket 2a, plus in brackets n minus 1 times d. For a geometric sequence, our general term is tn equals a times r to the power of n minus 1, and our sum formula is a in brackets r to the power of n minus 1, everything divided by r minus 1. Then we also have a sum to infinity. Please remember the sum to infinity is only for geometric sequence, and it's a over 1 minus r. And for a series to converge, my ratio must be between negative 1 and 1. Very important, they are on your formula sheet, but you need to know which one applies to an arithmetic and which one applies to a geometric. So let's go look at past papers. How do I approach these questions in a past paper? If we look at November 2018, they tell me, a geometric series has a constant ratio of a half and a sum to infinity of 6. So if I had to start this question, the first thing I would draw for myself is I would write down it's a geometric series. That helps me focus on what formulas I'm going to use. They tell me the ratio is a half, so I write that down, and I have a sum to infinity of equal to 6. So I write down all my information. Now I go to my question. 3.1. Calculate the first term of the series. What formula will I use? They've given me sum to infinity. My sum to infinity formula 
is a over 1 minus r. And now I can substitute. I know the sum to infinity is 6. They're asking me my a, my first term. I don't know that. 1 minus my ratio is a half. So 6 equals a over 1 minus a half is a half. And if I now go and multiply, divide both, sorry, multiply both sides by a half, I get that a is equal to 3. So there I've got my first term, a is 3. You will see was two marks. It's a mark for the substitution and a mark for the answer. Question 3.2. Calculate the eighth term of the series. Grade 12s, please read carefully. They said calculate the eighth term, referring to a term. So I need to use the term formula. How does that look again? For a geometric, Tn equals A times R to the power of N minus 1. What are they asking? The eighth term. So I've got to go substitute in 8. Let's write down what do we know. A is 3. R is equal to a half, and they are now asking the eighth term, so n is 8. So I can go term number 8 equals 3 times a half to the power of n is 8 minus 1. I can use my calculator, and I calculate the answer is 3 over 128. Once again, two marks. Substitution and answer. November 2021. I said consider the linear pattern. Now remember linear is another name for an arithmetic. So a linear and an arithmetic pattern is the same thing. So immediately I write down for myself it's arithmetic or linear. Consider the linear pattern. Determine term 51. So they're asking me the term, not the sum formula, the term. So let's write down what we have. 5, 7, and 9. I must get the term, so I know it's the term formula. Tn equals a plus in brackets n minus 1 times d. Let's do a shopping list on the side. What do we know? a, my first term is 5. d, what is my constant difference? How do I do that again? Second term minus the first, 7 minus 5, my constant difference is 2. So let's go work out the term formula first. Tn equals a is 5 plus n minus 1 times, remember when you substitute in d to do it in a bracket, and now I can solve by multiplying out the bracket. So it's 5, remember you've got to multiply the 2 with the n and the negative 1 plus 2n minus 2. If I add up my like terms, it's 2n plus 3. Have I finished this question yet? No. They said determine term 51. So I now have to go and work out if n was 51, what would it be equal to? So I go and substitute in 51 in n's place. So 2 times 51 plus 3. And now I can use my calculator and I get the answer is 105. This question counted three marks. So where did the three marks go? Very important that you show your work because they gave you a mark for showing what was A and what was D. Then a mark for substituting and getting to the formula and then a mark for the final answer. Question 4.2. Calculate the sum of the first 51st terms. Very important. What's my important word there? Calculate the sum. So I must use sum formula. What series do we have again? Arithmetic. So my sum formula, Sn, equals n over 2, bracket 2a, plus n minus 1 times d. Write down your shopping list on the side. What do you know? Do I know a? Yes. a is 5. Do I know d? Yes, d is 2. How many terms are they asking for? N is 51. Great 12s, remember if you substitute into the wrong formula, you don't get any marks. So please show your values on the side. So I'm working out the sum for the first 50 first terms. So the sum of 51 equals 51 over 2, bracket 2 times A is 5, plus 
n we said is 51 minus 1 and in a bracket for the d value or d is 2. I can type that in on my calculator and I get the answer is 2805. That question counted two marks. So where did the two marks go? Substitution and answer. Okay, let's go look at June 2022. So this was the paper that was just written for the rewrites. Very important once again that we read carefully. So if I read this question, the first term of an arithmetic series, so I'm going to write this down, it's arithmetic, so I can um, organize my thoughts. The first term, who's the first term again? A. The first term of an arithmetic sequence is equal to negative 1. And the seventh term, term 7, is equal to 35. Remember, in an arithmetic sequence, term 7, you can say is A plus 6 Ds. So that will be equal to 35. Now we go to the first question. Determine the common difference of this sequence. So for 2.1.1, they want me to work out D, the common difference. I have a formula here, A plus 6 D equals 35. And I know that A is equal to negative 1. So I can go sub that in. Negative 1 plus 6D equals 35. So 6D is 36. So D, my common difference, works out to be 6. Was two marks. A mark for setting up your equation with the negative 1 subbed in. And then a mark for the answer. 2.1.2. The number of the terms in the sequence, if the last term of the sequence is 473. The number of the terms in the sequence. So I'm going to have to use the term formula. This is an arithmetic. So once again, Tn equals A plus N minus 1 times D. Let me write down on the side, what do I know? I know A is negative 1. I just worked out D was 6. So let's go get the formula first. Tn equals A is negative 1 plus N minus 1 times D is 6. If I multiply out, it's negative 1 plus 6N minus 6. Add up my like terms. So it's 6N minus 7. What did they ask me? The number of terms, so they want to know what is n. In this sequence, if the last one is 473, so I can take my formula for my terms and make it equal to 473 because I want to know the number of terms, the last term. And now I've got an equation I can solve. That means 6n is equal to 480. And n, my number of terms, works out to be 80. So I'm going to finish off by saying there was 80 terms. This was a three-mark question. Where did the marks go? For getting the equation of the general term, putting it equal to 473, and then for calculating that there were 80 terms. 2.1.3. The sum, so very important that word sum, so now I'm using the sum formula of the first 40 terms in the sequence. This is an arithmetic, so Sn equals n over 2, bracket 2a, plus n minus 1 times d. The sum of the first 40 terms, so I know n must be 40. I know our a value is negative 1, and the d is 6, so I can substitute in. Remember your little shopping list on the side to help you. So the sum of 40 terms would be 40 over 2, bracket 2, a is negative 1, plus in brackets, n we worked out was, they said is 40, minus 1, and remember the d when you sub it in in a bracket, times 6. Now I can go to my calculator, and my answer works out to be 4,640. Two marks, so it's a mark for the substitution and a mark for the answer. Question 2.2, tell us 
75, 53, 35, and 21 is a quadratic number pattern. So we haven't looked at one like this in this video. Please remember there is a separate video on quadratic number patterns that you can go and look at if you need some revision on this. We are just going to go over this one as well. So 75, 53, 35, and 21. Write down the first term of this number pattern. What do we know about quadratic number patterns? The second difference is constant. So let's see what's happening here. 53 minus 75 gives me negative 22. 35 minus 53 is negative 18. 21 minus 35 is negative 14. Remember, this is the first difference. What do we know about the first differences is they always form a linear number pattern or an arithmetic series. So what would the next one have been? Negative 22, negative 18, negative 14. I'm going up by 4 the whole time, so the next one would have been negative 10. So 21 minus 10, the next term would have been 11. And that was one mark for your answer. 2.2.2. Determine the nth term of this number pattern. If you are struggling with this, please remember to go and watch the video on quadratic number patterns. We're going to go over this again quickly. So to get my first differences, 35 minus 75 is negative 22. 35 minus 53 is negative 18. 21 minus 35 is negative 14. That's my first differences. We know for a quadratic number pattern, those aren't constant, so I've got to do it again. Negative 18 minus, 20 minus negative 22 is 4. Negative 14 minus negative 18 is also 4. My second difference is constant. So to get our formula again, we know 2a is equal to my second difference. So 2a is equal to 4, so a is 2. We know the first term of the first differences is equal to 3a plus b. So 3a plus b is equal to negative 22. We just calculated a was 2, so we can substitute that in. And we can work out that b is negative 28. And when the, then we know the first term of the original series is equal to a plus b plus c. So a plus b plus c equals 75. a I calculated as 2. b is negative 28. I can substitute them in. Plus c equals 75. So c calculates to be 101. So what is my general term? tn equals 2n squared minus 28n plus 101. Just a reminder, grade 12s, that the quadratic number pattern or sequences formulas are not on the, num on the formula sheet. Those are the ones that you have to go and study. Sigma notation. The sign sigma is the symbol for the word the sum of. So what does that mean? If I give you sigma, the number at the bottom is the first number that you need to sub into your general term. The equation next to the sigma sign is the equation for the general term. And the number at the top is the last number you sub in. So for this example, you would be adding up term 1, term 2, term 3, term 4, all the way till the last term. What's the last number you would sub in? Term n. So as we said, sigma means I must calculate the sum, which means I will be using, working with sum formulas. We've got two sum formulas, one for an arithmetic. So this is on my formula sheet, and I must recognize that that is my arithmetic formula. It's Sn equals n over 2, 2a plus n minus 1d. And then one for my geometric is Sn equals a bracket r to the power of n minus 1 divided by r minus 1. Remember, for a geometric, we can also ask sum to infinity. It's only for a geometric series. That's a divided by 1 minus r. And also, please remember, for sum to infinity, your ratio must be between negative 1 and 1. So let's go look at an example. If I give you the sum, what does the sum mean? It means I must calculate the sum. So I must go and calculate the sum. To calculate the sum, I must first determine 
is this an arithmetic or is this a geometric? So I can know which sum formula to do. Also, I must know for how many terms. So how do I know for how many terms? To determine the amount of terms, you take the number at the top minus the number at the bottom and you add one. So 25 minus 2 plus 1 means there's 24 terms in this sequence. How do I determine what type of sequence is this, arithmetic or geometric? I go and I calculate the first three terms. So what is the first number that I must substitute into the general term? I must first substitute in 2. So if I go work out my first three terms and I substitute in 2, I get the answer is 11. The next number I'll substitute in is 3. And then I get it 6. The third number I'll substitute in is 4. And then the answer works out to be 1. So if I have the sequence 11, 6, 1, what type of sequence is this? This is an arithmetic sequence. So now really I know that. What is my A value? What is my first value in my arithmetic sequence? What is my D value? A is 11. D, what's my constant difference? Negative 5. What do I need to calculate? Sigma means I need to calculate the sum. What did we say N is? For how many terms? 24. So I must get the sum now. I know the sum formula for an arithmetic sequence. Sin equals N over 2. 2A brackets 2A plus N minus 1 times D. Now I can substitute in. Grade 12s, please remember, if you substitute into the wrong formula, you will not get any marks. So ensure that you use your correct formulas. So if I substitute in, Sn equals 24 over 2 in brackets, 2 times 11 plus 24 minus 1 times negative 5. And I get Sn is negative 1116. Now just to finish off my sum, I finish off by saying it means the sum for this is equal to negative 1116. Please make sure you finish off your sum by writing down the answer at the end in the correct format. If I give you the sequence 16 plus 9 plus 22 plus 25, and I ask you to write the above in sigma notation for n terms, so now I must write it in sigma notation. First of all, orientate yourself. What type of series is this? Arithmetic or geometric? I've already given you the terms. This is an arithmetic series. A is 16, B is 3. They've said for n terms, so n is n. And remember, in my sigma notation, I give the general formula, so I need to calculate Tn. Tn for arithmetic is a plus n minus 1 times b. If I substitute in, 16 plus n minus 1 times 3, the general term is 3n plus 13. So how do I write this in sigma notation? Sigma, the general term is 3. In this case, it's supposed to be a k or an n. It doesn't matter, plus 13. What was the first number we subbed in was 1. What was the last number at the top? They said for n terms, so n. Let's go look at some past papers. In November 2021, question 4.3. They said, Write down the expansion. That means I must write out of, they've given me sigma notation, in the first number I must sub in is 1, the last number I'm going to substitute in is 5,000, and the general rule is 2n plus 3. Show only the first three terms and the last term of this expansion. So they want us to write out what is the first three numbers and what is the last number. So let's go work it out. What would term 1 be? I use my general rule. 2 times what's the first number I must sub in? 1. 2 times 1 plus 3 is 5. Term 2. 2 times 2 plus 3. 4 plus 3 is 7. Term 3. 2 times 3 plus 3. 6 plus 3 is 9. So I've got the first three terms. It's 5 plus 7 plus 9. Read the question again. Show only the first three terms. We have them. And the last term of this expansion. So I must do the last one. What is the last one again? The last number I must sub in is 5,000. So term 5,000. 2 times 5,000. 
plus 3 is 10,003. So plus, I don't have to show any of the numbers in between and only the last one. I must show the expansion, which means I must write it out. And that was one mark. One mark for showing that expansion. November 2019. November 2019 looks a lot more difficult than it is. The question is actually a lot simpler. It says, without using a calculator, and this is the bit that throws most matrix, but it's not that difficult, determine the value of that. So the sum of 1 over y minus 2, the first y value I'm going to substitute in is 3, and the last one is 10, and I must subtract the sum of 1 over y minus 1, the first y value I must substitute in is 3, and the last one is 10, and I'm not allowed to use my calculator. So the only way to do this is by writing it out. So let's go do the first one first. I'm going to put it in a bracket. Okay. What is the first number I must sub in? 3. 1 over 3 minus 2. What is 3 minus 2? 3 minus 2 is 1. Okay, what does the sign mean? Sum, so I'm going to add them all. The next value I must sub in is 4. So 1 over 4 minus 2 is 2. And I must continue all the way to 10. 1 over 5 minus 2 is 3. 1 over 6 minus 2 is 4. 1 over 7 minus 2 is 5. 1 over 8 minus 2 is 6. 1 over 9 minus 2 is 7. And the last one I'm subbing in is 10. 1 over 10 minus 2 is 8. Then I've got to subtract minus. And I've got to go do the sum for the next one. So I'm going to do it in a different color fuss. What is the first value I'm subbing in now? 3. The last one I'm going to substitute in is 10. So I'm going to start again. 1 over 3 minus 1 is 2. Plus, remember, that means sum. So I must do the sum. 1 over 4 minus 1 is 3. 1 over 5 minus 1 is 4. 1 over 6 minus 1 is 5. 1 over 7 minus 1 is 6. 1 over 8 minus 1 is 7. 1 over 9 minus 1 is 8. And the last one I'm subbing in, 1 over 10 minus 1 is 9. So remember they said no calculator, so I'm not going to do a calculator at all. So I'm just going to write out. The first bracket, there's nothing for me to do there. I'm just going to write it down. So it's 1 over 1 is 1, plus a half, plus a third. Continuing like that all the way, a quarter, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, and an eighth. Minus the second sum. Remember the negative belongs to the entire bracket. So that changes my signs. So that's then minus a half, minus a third, minus a quarter, minus a fifth. Going on like that, a sixth, a seventh, a eighth, and a ninth. And now you should notice something. Seeing they said we're not using a calculator. Plus a half, minus a half cancels. Plus a third, minus a third. A quarter, minus a quarter. A fifth, minus a fifth. A sixth, minus a sixth. A seventh, minus a seventh. And an eighth, minus eighth. So what is left? One minus one over nine. One minus one ninth is eight over nine. I did not need a calculator, I just had to show all my steps. Three marks. Where did the three marks go? Showing the expansion of the first one, showing the expansion of the second one, and then getting the answer. That was your three marks. November 2018. They have given us that, and they ask us to calculate the value of n. So how do I approach this? They've given me sigma notation, which means sum. The first value I'm subbing in, k is 1. The last one, that is n. 3 bracket 2 to the power of 1 minus k equals 5,8125. And they say, 
calculate the value of n. What does this mean again? Sigma notation means sum, but they've given you the answer of the sum. So I know what Sn is. They've given me it's equal to. I know what is Sn. Sn is equal to 5,8125. The question said calculate for n, so I must calculate n. My only issue is I don't know if it's in arithmetic or geometric. So I need to go figure that out so I can know what sum formula to use. How do I do that again? By calculating the first three terms. Term 1. What's the first thing I must sub in? 1. Where's the formula? There's the general formula. So 3 times 2 to the power of 1 minus 1. And that gives me 3. Term 2. 3 times 2 to the power of 1 minus 2. And that gives me 3 over 2. Term 3. 3 times 2 to the power of 1 minus 3 gives me 3 over 4. Is this an arithmetic or a geometric? This is a geometric series. Okay, so now I know the formula. The geometric series. Sn equals A bracket r to the power of n minus 1, everything over r minus 1. So what must I still write down on my shopping list? I still need to know what's A. What is A again? A is my first term. My first term is 3. I also need to know what is my ratio. How do I calculate my ratio again? Term 2 divided by term 1. Your ratio is term 2 divided by term 1. 3 over 2 divided by 3, my ratio is a half. And now I can go and calculate. I have SN, 5, 8125 equals, A I know is 3, bracket, I know my ratio is a half. So keep that half in a bracket, please. To the power of N, I don't know that, minus 1. Everything over a half minus 1. And now I can start solving. Okay, let's solve the half minus to the bottom first. 5 comma 8, 1, 2, 5 equals 3 in brackets, a half to the power of n minus 1. A half minus 1 is negative a half. I want to get rid of the denominator. If I multiply both sides by negative a half, I get negative 93 over 32 equals 3 times in brackets a half to the power of n minus 1. Next step is to get rid of the 3. So if I divide both sides by 3, I get negative 31 over 32 equals a half to the power of n minus 1. Next I've got to bring, I've got to get rid of the negative 1. So if I now add 1 on both sides, I get 1 over 32 equals a half to the power of n. So what does this mean? I'm asking you a half to the power of what would give you 32. And that would be n should be 5. Why? Because 2 to the power of 5 is 32. So a half to the power of 5 would be 1 over 32. If you are struggling with your exponent laws, you are welcome to use logs. So how does that work again? If I give you 1 over 32 equals a half to the power of n, I can write it in log form. So it's log with a base of a half, 1 over 32 equals n. I can type that in in my calculator and I would also get n equals 5. So you are always welcome to use logs if you're struggling with your exponents. This was a four mark question. Where did the four marks go? The first mark was for calculating that the ratio was a half. Then for substituting into the formula. Then for simplification up until there. And then your final mark, whichever method you did for getting that n is equal to 5. And those were our four marks. We receive a formula sheet for the grade 12 end of year paper. These formulas appear on the formula sheet. The first one is the sum to infinity. Remember the sum to infinity only exists for a geometric series. The sum to infinity is A divided by 1 minus R. For a sum to infinity ex to exist, my ratio 
must be between negative 1 and 1, which means my series must converge. An infinite series is one in which there is no last term. That means the series goes on without ending. If you can identify a convergent infinite series by looking at the value of r, an infinite series is convergent if the ratio lies between negative 1 and 1, and very important, the ratio cannot be equal to 0. So if I look at a convergent series, if I give you the series 1 plus a half plus a quarter, an eighth and a sixteenth, what is my ratio for this series? My ratio for this series is a half. How do I calculate the ratio again? I say it's the second term divided by the first. A half divided by 1 is a half. And I can check by saying term 3 divided by term 2, a quarter divided by a half is also a half. This means this is an infinite series, convergent, if the ratio is between negative 1 and 1, and the ratio is not equal to 0. What is our ratio here? Our ratio here is a half. This means this series will converge, and it converges towards the number 2. If I give you the series 2 plus 6 plus 18 plus 54, the terms of this series are all positive, and the number and the sum will be getting bigger and bigger without any end. If you want to calculate the ratio for this one, term 2 divided by term 1 is 3. Term 3 divided by term 2 is 3. That ratio is 3. Is 3 between negative 1 and 1? No. So this is not a convergent series. This is called a divergent series. So let's look at a past paper, November 2020. Give me the question 3.1. They say prove that, and remember sigma means sum. If you've missed our previous videos on it, you can go back and go watch the videos on the sigma notation and calculating the sum. There is a whole series on them for you. So they say sigma means I'm going to calculate the sum to where? To infinity. The first value they're subbing in, k is equal to 1, and they give me the formula. 4 times 3 to the power of 2 minus k. They tell me this is a convergent series. We've got to prove that this is a convergent geometric series. And we have to show all our calculations. So what do we know about a convergent geometric series? That the ratio is between negative 1 and 1. So we've got to calculate the ratio. How do we start? Whenever you get sigma notation, the first thing you do is you calculate the first three terms. So term 1. I'm going to go 4 times 3 to the power of 2 minus, what's the first value of my substitute into k? 1. So 4 times 3 to the power of 1, and that gives me 12. Term 2. 4 times 3 to the power of 2 minus 2, I'm subbing in now. 2 minus 2 is 0. 3 to the power of 0 is 1. Times 4 is 4. Term 3. 4 times 3 to the power of 2 minus, and now I'm substituting 3. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. 3 to the power of negative 1 is a third. 4 times a third is 4 over 3. There is my geometric series. So remember they said I must prove that this is a convergent geometric series, which means I must determine my ratio. How do I determine my ratio again? Term 2 divided by term 1. My second term was 4. My first term was 12. 4 divided by 12 is a third. I can check it by saying term 3 divided by term 2. 4 over 3 divided by 4 is also a third. Now, your ratio worked out to be a third. Great 12s, it's very important how you write your answer. So now you must tell me, you know that a third is bigger than negative 1 and it's smaller than 1. And you must also add in for me then that that means the ratio is bigger than negative 1 and smaller than 1. This is a very important last step. You have to show that the third is between negative 1 and 1, and that means the ratio is between negative 1 and 1. This was a three mark question. So where did the marks go? One mark for calculating the first three terms, a mark for calculating the ratio, and then a mark for this final conclusion, those last two steps. So please remember to show that. Question 3.2. They're giving me 
Sigma notation again, which means sum. Sum to where? Infinity. Now they tell me at the bottom k is equal to p. Be careful there. It is the same formula, 4 times 3 to the power of 2 minus k, and they say equals to 2 over 9. And they're asking me, determine the value of p. So now I must work out what was the first number they subbed in. So let's go write down what do I have. Remember, sigma means the sum. The sum to infinity, and they've given me what it's equal to. So I know the sum to infinity is equal to 2 over 9. I just worked out the ratio was a third, so I know that. Do I know what was the first number? You cannot assume it's the 12 from the top. Because in 3.1, they told us the first number we're subbing in is 1. Now they haven't told me what the first number to sub in is, so I don't know what's A. So I need to go and calculate A first before I can get B. Okay, so I've got the sum to infinity equals A over 1 minus R. A is 2 over 9. Sorry, sum to infinity is 2 over 9. I don't know what's A. 1 minus my ratio is a third. So if I start to simplify, that's 2 over 9 equals A over 1 minus a third is 2 thirds. If I now multiply both sides by 2 thirds, I get 2 over 9 times 2 thirds is 4 over 27 is equal to A. And there I have calculated my A value. Read the question and see if you are done. It says determine the value of P, so I don't know what's P yet. P was, what is the first number you subbed in to get you the first term? But I now know the first term was going to be 4 over 27. So how did I do it originally? When I had that the first number you subbed in was 1, you took your formula, you said 4 times 3 to the power of 2 minus, and then you subbed in 1 and you got the first term. But now I want to know what was that first number you subbed in. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. I want to know what's the first number. So I'm going to go 4 times 3 to the power of 2 minus. I don't know what the first number is. I'm going to make it the P, they say. But I know I must get an answer of 4 over 27. And now I can solve my equation. Divide by 4, both sides first. First, so 3 to the power of 2 minus p equals 1 over 27. Remember, 1 over 27 is 3 to the power of negative 3. If your bases are equal, your exponents are equal. So 2 minus p is equal to negative 3. So p calculates to be 5. Please remember, you can also use logs. So you could have logged it. You could have said when you got to the step of 3 to the power of 2 minus p equals 1 over 27. You are welcome to write it in log format. So logs, log of 1 over 27 with a base of 3 will then be equal to 2 minus p. That you can calculate on your calculator. You would have got a negative 3 equals 2 minus p. And P would then also have calculated to be 5. This counted 5 marks. Where would we allocate the 5 marks? A mark for the substitution into the formula and calculating the A value. Then a mark for setting up your equation to work out what P was. A mark for simplification and a mark for your final answer. Okay, great. Well, so in this one, we asked you to prove that the series is convergent. What is the other way we can ask you a question? We can give you a series, 1, 3 in brackets, 2 minus b, second one, 9 in brackets, 2 minus b squared. And I can ask you this question in two ways. I can either ask you to calculate the value of p if the series converges, or I can tell you to calculate the value of p for which the sum of infinity will exist. Remember, a sum of infinity will only exist if a series is convergent. So these are the two different ways I can ask this question. The first thing you need to know is, remember, we need to calculate our ratio. How do I calculate my ratio again? My ratio is term 2 divided by term 1. And to calculate your ratio, you would say second term divided by first. Your second term was 3 brackets 2 minus p divided by 1. So your ratio was 3 
times in brackets 2 minus p. What do I know about a convergence series? The ratio must be between what? Negative 1 and 1. So I know my ratio is between negative 1 and 1, so now I can substitute it in. That means 3 times in brackets 2 minus p must be greater than negative 1 or smaller than 1. I can divide both sides by 3. Then I get 2 minus p must be greater than negative a third or smaller than a third. Then if I take the 2 over to both sides, I get negative p is greater than negative 7 over 3 or smaller than negative 5 over 3. And then please remember, grade 12, that when you multiply or divide by a negative, the signs of your inequality changes. And we then get that p is smaller than 7 over 3 or bigger than 5 over 3. And those are the values that will make this series converge. If we look at our hyperbola and parabola, there are certain things we need to pay attention to. First of all, let's look at the hyperbola. The equation for hyperbola is y is equal to a over x plus b plus q. The a value helps us determine in which quadrants the hyperbola will be drawn. If a is greater than zero, my hyperbola is drawn in the first and in the third quadrant. And if a is smaller than zero, my hyperbola is in the second and in the fourth quadrant. Great twelves, when we are drawing graphs, no matter what type of graph you draw, we always calculate an x and a y intercept. To calculate the x intercept, we make y equal to zero. And to calculate the y intercept, we make x into equal to zero. So no matter what type of graph I give you, those are the standard things I have to do. I calculate my x-intercept and my y-intercept. And then I look at what is unique about this graph. For a hyperbola, what is unique? We have two asymptotes. First of all, I have a vertical asymptote, and that is where x is equal to negative the p-value. Why negative the p-value? That would make the denominator of the fraction 0, and then my fraction would be undefined, and that, why that, that is why x equals negative p is my vertical asymptote. My horizontal asymptote is where y is equal to our q value. When looking at our parabola, you will notice these three forms for the equation. The equation of a parabola can be given in three different forms. The first one is called standard form. So y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. It looks like our normal trinomial. The second form is y equals a in a bracket x plus p squared plus q. And the third type is y is equal to a x minus root 1 bracket x minus root 2. And that is called my x-intercept form. Once again, when drawing a parabola, what do I need to pay attention for to? If the a value is greater than 0, I have a, what we call a happy parabola. And if the a value is smaller than zero, I have a sad parabola, one that's facing down. What are the standard things I will be calculating with the parabola? X-intercept and Y-intercept. What is unique about the parabola? It has a turning point. Now, there's two ways I can get the turning point. There's actually three ways. We did calculus. So we remember from calculus, whenever I want to get a turning point, I make the first derivative equal to zero. I can say it's I can read off the turning point coordinate by negative p and q. Or we can use the equation to calculate the x value, that x is negative b over 2a, and then substitute to get y. Please remember the x value of the turning point is my axis of symmetry. And remember, if the a value is greater than 0, we have an parabola that is facing upwards, or as we call it, a happy parabola. And if it's a value smaller than zero, parabola facing downwards, or as we say, a sad parabola. The Q value, not turning point, will reflect my minimum or my maximum point on my parabola. So if we look at the first parabola, where A is greater than zero, we will have a minimum turning point. And if I look at the second parabola, where A is smaller than zero, we have a maximum turning point. When we look at transformations, that is when we are moving our graphs or reflecting our graphs. If I move, a, I can move a graph left or right. So in our example, if I tell you f of x plus 7, it means I've moved the graph 7 units to the left. If we plus a 7 or plus a 5, it means I've moved left. 
if we subtract, it means the graph has moved to the right. What else can we do? We can move a graph up or down. So if I move a graph up, it will be f of x and then plus 5 at the back, where if you move the graph down like the second picture, it will be f of x minus 7 at the back. We can also reflect our graphs. We can do a reflection in the x-axis. When I reflect in the x-axis, the y values change. So we put the negative in front of the y, so it's negative f of x. If I reflect in the line y equals x, it means I am swapping my x and y coordinates. So I'm actually doing an inverse graph. And if I reflect in the y-axis, my x values will change. So the negative goes in front of the x, so it's f of negative x. So let's go and look at some past facts. November 2020, question 4.1. They've given us h of x, and they've said it's equal to negative 3 over x minus 1 plus 2. From the equation, you should recognize immediately that this will be a hyperbola. First question. They're asking me, Write down the equations of the asymptotes of x. Will my asymptotes, and hyperbole has got two asymptotes, an so x and a y. What is the x asymptote? It's negative, negative 1. So that will be x is equal to 1. And the y one will be y is equal to 2. Vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Two marks. 1, 2. 4.1.2. Determine the equation of the axis of symmetry of H that has a negative gradient. Remember, we have two axes of symmetry for our hyperbola. They're asking my negative one. So that's Y equals negative X plus C. How do I determine the C value? I sub in the coordinate where the asymptotes cross. Where will the asymptotes cross? At 1, 2. So I'm going to substitute in that coordinate. 2 equals negative Substituting in 1 in x's place, negative 1 plus c. So c works out to be 3. So the equation of the axis of symmetry with a negative gradient is y is equal to negative x plus 3. That question counted two marks. So the two marks are allocated that you subbed in the coordinate in the one with the negative gradient. It had to be the negative gradient and then the final answer. Grade 12s, if they had asked you to calculate the one with the positive gradient, it would be y equals x plus c, and then we would sub in 1, 2 into that. Please read very carefully the, ask the one with the negative gradient. 4.1.3. Sketch the graph of h showing the asymptotes and the intercepts with the axes. Okay, so we have to go and sketch our graph. The first thing we do is we draw in the asymptotes. What are my asymptotes again? X equals 1. Please remember to write at the bottom that X equals 1 to indicate it, that that is the vertical asymptote. Our horizontal asymptote was Y equals 2. Drawing, so if you draw in your horizontal asymptote, write there Y equals 2. If you look at your graph, in which quadrants will this hyperbola be? The A value is negative 3. That means I will be in the second and in the fourth quadrant. So I can draw my graph. It's in the second quadrant. Please pay attention to your shape. You are approaching your asymptotes and never touching them. And in the fourth quadrant. So what am I still missing? I am missing my x-intercept and my y-intercept. I need to determine those coordinates. Okay, how do I determine the y-intercept again? I make x equal to 0. So you take your equation, y equals negative 3. Instead of x, you substitute in a 0 minus 1 plus 2. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. Negative 3 divided by negative 1 is 3 plus 2 is 5. So the y-intercept is the coordinate 0, 5. I also need my x-intercept. 
to calculate the x-intercept, we make y equal to 0. So 0 equals negative 3 over x minus 1 plus 2. And now I can solve that. That means negative 2 equals negative 3 over x minus 1. If I multiply both sides by x minus 1, I get negative 2 times x minus 1 equals negative 3. That's negative 2x plus 2 equals negative 3. I can solve this equation. And x works out to be 5 over 2 or 2 and a half. So that coordinate, x is 5 over 2 and y is 0. Four marks. Where did the four marks go? And grade 12s, this is why it's so important that you indicate everything on the graph they asked. They said, sketch the graph showing the asymptotes. Yes, I've got my asymptotes in. And the intercepts with the axis, so the x and the y intercept. So where did the four marks work? The four marks were allocated one mark for the y-intercept, but it had to be on the graph. They do not mark your calculation. One mark for the x-intercept on the graph. They do not mark the calculation. A mark that you indicated both the asymptotes, and then a mark that your shape is correct and you are in the correct quadrants. And there is your four marks. So please ensure that everything you need is indicated on your graph. We do not mark the calculations on the side. It must appear on the graph. November 2022 still question 4.2. They've given us the graph and they said fx is equal to a half in brackets x plus 5 squared minus 8. And gx is equal to a half x plus 9 over 2, or sketched below. A is the turning point of f. The axis of symmetry of f intersects the x-axis at E, and the line g at the point D, M, N. C is the y-intercept of both the f and the g graphs. First question. Write down the coordinates of A. They said write down. They didn't say calculate. A is our turning point. If you look at the equation of the parabola, it's already written in turning point form. So I can read it off. I know it will be negative 5 and negative 8. Two marks. 1, 2. 4.2.2. Write down the range of the F graph. The range of the F graph refers to the Y values. So what do we know about the y values? In this graph, we have a minimum turning point. So the y's will be greater or equal to negative 8. And the y's can be any real number greater or equal to negative 8. Remember, you are allowed to also write it in any notation you want. So you could have said square bracket negative 8 to infinity. And remember, infinity would have a round bracket. And that was a one mark question, so one mark. November 2021. They've given me the graph. They said fx is equal to x plus 4 in the first bracket, and in the second bracket, x minus 6 is drawn below. The parabola cuts the x-axis at B and D, so those would be the two x-intercepts, and the y-axis at G. C is the turning point of F. Line AE has an angle of inclination of theta and cuts the x-axis and the y-axis at A and E, respectively. T is a point of F between B and G. First question, write down the coordinates of B and D. Once again, write down, not calculate. How can they ask that? Because the equation was already given in x-intercept form. So it's already been factorized for you. So you know what the two x-intercepts will be. The one will be negative 4 and the other one will be 6. Now you just have to decide from your graph which one is which. B is on the negative side. So B will be negative 4, 0. 
and D is the one on the positive side, so that will be 6, 0. Two marks, an easy two marks. 7.2. Calculate the coordinate of C. Why are they asking me C? Because C is the turning point. Now, there's a few ways we can do this. I'm just quickly going to redraw the sketch roughly. There is coordinate C. We just worked out that B is negative 4, 0, and that D is 6, 0. The turning point of a parabola is exactly halfway between the two x-intercepts. So what number is exactly in the middle between negative 4 and 6? What number is exactly halfway between negative 4 and 6? Negative 4 plus 6 divided by 2, that would give me 1. So I know x must be at 1. So I know the x value is 1. x is equal to 1. The question said, calculate the co ordinate so I need the y value as well how can I determine the y if I know x is 1 I can substitute it into my formula y equals 1 plus 4 in a bracket times 1 minus 6 and y works out to be negative 25 so that means c is the coordinate 1 and negative 25 that was two marks it was two a mark for determining that x is 1 and then a mark for determining the y is negative 25. Question 7.3. Write down the range of the f graph. The range refers to the y values. Once again, this graph will have a minimum value. So my y values will be bigger than what is my minimum y value. We just calculated it to be negative 25. So y is greater or equal to negative 25, and it can be any real number greater or equal to negative 25. Or you could have written it in the other notation. You could have said, remember, square bracket if it's equal, negative 25 to infinity, and that must have a round bracket. And that was also just a one mark question. November 2019. Now they're asking us to determine the equation. So now we're done sketching. They tell us below is the graphs of fx equals x to the power of 2 plus bx minus 3 and also gx is a over x plus p. F has a turning point at C and passes through the x-axis at the coordinate 1, 0. D is the y-intercept of both the F and the G graphs. The F and G also intersect each other at E and J. The vertical asymptote of G passes through the x-intercept of F and they're indicating it to me on the picture. So the first question, 4.1. Write down the value of B. Once again, not calculate, just write it down. What does B represent? The vertical asymptote of the hyperbola. So if I look at it, the vertical asymptote of the hyperbola is at 1. So my P value will be negative 1. 4.2. Show that A is equal to 3 and B is equal to 2. Where is A? A is in the equation of the hyperbola. B is in the equation of the parabola. So I must go show those values for A, which means I must go and calculate them. I'm going to start with the parabola. fx equals x squared plus bx minus 3. And I'm going to substitute in a coordinate on this graph. What coordinate do I have? I have 1, 0. So I'm going to substitute that in. 0 equals 1 squared plus b times 1 minus 3. So 0 equals 1 plus b minus 3. So b works out to be 2. There I've got b. Okay, and now I must still get a. What was the equation again? gx equals a over x plus p. Do I have a coordinate that I can sub in? 
not that I can read off the graph, but if I look at the hyperbola, I can see there that it goes through coordinate D. And what makes coordinate D unique? I know it is the y-intercept of both the hyperbola and the parabola. So what is coordinate D? What is coordinate D? It is the y-intercept of the parabola, but I know what the equation of the parabola is. I just work, worked it out. Remember, to get the y-intercept, I make x equal to 0. So if I substitute in 0 in my parabola, it's 0 squared. Let's say I did not know what b was yet, and I just said I didn't know what b was yet. Maybe I had not done this step yet. b times 0 minus 3, that's all 0, so y is equal to negative 3. So d is the coordinate. 0, negative 3. So now I have a coordinate I can substitute in. So I can go negative 3 equals a over 0 plus p. 0 plus p is, sorry, we already calculated p. Almost forgot that. p was negative 1. So negative 3 equals a over 0 minus negative 1. So if I now calculate A, I can work out that A is equal to 3. Where was our marks allocated? It was only three marks. The first mark was for substituting in the 1, 0, and then getting to the B value. Why are they not giving a mark for B equals 2? Because it's on the question paper. The next mark was for calculating the D coordinate of 0, negative 3, and then for substituting into the hyperbola for formula. Once again, not giving a mark for A equals 3, because that is already on the question paper. If we move over to June 2019, they have given us the following. They said sketched below are the graphs of Kx. Kx has an equation of ax squared plus bx plus c, and hx has an equation of negative 2x plus 4. Graph k has a turning point at negative 118, it's on my sketch, and s is the x-intercepts of both the h and the k graphs. Graphs h and k also intersect at t, 5.2.1. Calculate the coordinate of S. Now, there's two ways you can get the coordinate of S. Remember, they said S is the x-intercept of both the K and the H graphs. You've got the complete equation for the H graph. So how do I calculate the x-intercept again? I make Y equal to 0. So I'm going to say 0 equals negative 2X plus 4, which means 2X is equal to 4 and X is equal to 2, which means S is the coordinate 2 zero. Two marks. A mark for making the equation equal to zero and then a mark for writing down the S coordinate. 5.2.2. Determine the equation of K in the form and now pay close attention to what form they're asking. They're asking if Y equals A bracket X plus P close the bracket squared plus q. They're asking it in turning point form. On your sketch, you have the turning point. So, y is equal to a, x minus negative 1 becomes x plus 1 for my x value, and for the q value, what is q if we read it off? Plus 18. Now I still need to determine the value of a, which means I have to substitute in another point. What other point do I have on this graph? S. We just calculated it. So I can go substitute in 2, 0 to calculate the value of A. 0 equals A. My X value is 2 plus 1 squared plus 18. That means 0 equals, that's 3 squared is 18. plus 18. That means negative 18 is equal to 9a and a is equal to negative 2.
So what is the final formula? Y is equal to negative 2 brackets x plus 1 close the bracket squared plus 18. Remember that asked you to give it in this form, so you have to give it in this form. Three marks. Where did my three marks go? The first one for writing in the turning point in the turning point form. Then for substituting in two zero, and then for calculating A and getting to your final answer. If we look a little bit further back to March 2015. This was question six in that paper. They gave us the graph of fx equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And they said a is not equal to zero. And then they also gave us gx is equal to mx plus k are drawn below. D, the coordinate 1, negative 8, is a common point on both f and g. F intersects the x-axis at negative 3, 0 and 2, 0. So they've given you both the x-intercepts. G is a tangent to F at D. The first question, 6.1. For what values of x is fx small or equal to 0? So if I just do a little sketch here on the side to illustrate it for us quickly. We had our x-intercepts at negative 3, 0 and at 2, 0. They ask me for what values of x is fx small or equal to 0. So they're asking where are the y values negative. So that's the, that section. So it's all the x's between negative 3 and 2. So it's the x's greater than negative 3, smaller than 2. Now I must determine, do I need an equal sign underneath these? Go check in your question. Did the question have an equal underneath? Yes, so equal underneath. Otherwise, x can be any real number in between. Remember, you can also you can pick your notation. If you use the second notation, you have to use square brackets because it's equal. Negative 3 to 2 and square bracket. This was two marks. It was a mark for determining the critical value. So a mark for the negative 3 and a 2. And then a mark that your signs, your notation was correct. So if you used the second method, mark for the negative 3 and a 2, and a mark that you had square brackets. 6.2. Determine the values of A, B, and C. So where is A, B, and C? A, B, and C are all in the formula of my parabola. So I must get the formula for the parabola. So what is the only things I know? I'm just going to write in this coordinate D of 1 and negative 8. They've given me this parabola, but they've given me the x-intercepts. So I'm going to start with x-intercept form. So y equals a, x minus the first root, x minus the second root. And I know what the two roots are. y is equal to a, x minus negative 3 becomes plus 3, x minus 2. Okay, now I still need to calculate a. How can I calculate a? I substitute in a coordinate on the graph. I can't use the negative 3 and the 2 again. I've already used them. So who have I not used? The 1 and negative 8. So let's go substitute in 1, negative 8. Negative 8 equals a. x is now 1 plus 3 in the first bracket, and in the second bracket, 1 minus 2. Negative 8 equals 1 plus 3 is 4. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4, so that's negative 4a. If I divide both sides by negative 4, a is equal to 2. Am I done with this question yet? No, the question said calculate the values of A, B, and C. I've only got A. How do I get B and C? I go back to my equation. I now know what A is. So Y equals 2 bracket X plus 3, second bracket X minus 2. And I can now multiply out to get it in standard form. If I multiply that out, it's X squared. Minus 2x plus 3x is plus 1x. 
minus 6. And then I can multiply in my 2. So that's 2x squared plus 2x minus 12. So what are the values? A was 2. What is the value of B? B is also 2. And what is the value of C? C is negative 12. This was a five mark question. So where did they allocate the five marks? The first mark was for writing it in x-intercept form and substituting in the two x-intercepts. Then for substituting in the coordinate 1, negative 8, and for calculating that a is 2. And then for multiplying out and coming to the conclusion that b is 2 and c is negative 12. Question 6.3. They ask us, determine the coordinates of the turning point of F. Now, there's a few ways you can do this. Remember, we now have the equation of Fx. And even if you struggled, we're going to look at a few methods to do this. So Fx we have now is the equation 2x squared plus 2x minus 12. How can I get the turning point of a parabola? You can first use the formula if you want of x is negative b over 2a. So x is, what is b again? 2. So negative 2 over 2a is also 2. So that works out to be 2, uh, negative 2 over 4. So that's negative a half. They said the coordinates of the turning point. So I also need the y value, which means I'm a substitute it into my original one. So 2 times negative a half squared plus 2 times negative a half minus 12. And that works out to be negative 12 comma 5. So the turning points coordinate is negative a half and negative 12 comma 5. How would they have allocated those three marks? It's a mark for calculating the x then a mark for the substitution, and a mark for the final formula. But remember, I said there's more than one way to do this question. We've done calculus, and we know with calculus, to get a turning point, the first derivative is equal to zero. So the alternative method for 6.3 would be to say, I know it's where the first derivative is equal to zero. Let's just write down the equation of fx for us again. It's 2x squared plus 2x minus 12. So what would my first derivative be? It would be 4x plus 2 equals 0. That means 4x is equal to negative 2, and once again, x works out to be negative a half. So that is the alternative method to get the x. To get the y, you have to substitute it back into the parabola's equation. And once again, if I sub in negative a half, I'll get negative 12 comma 5. And the turning point is then at negative a half and negative 12 comma 5. Three marks. The, these three marks would have gone for exactly the same things. So you could have had calculating the x, substituting in the coordinate. Question 6.4. Write down the equation of the axis of symmetry of H. Now, we haven't had H before. What is H? Hx is the F graph. And look at what they've done. They've said X minus 7 plus 2. What does that X minus 7 mean? It means I have moved the parabola. How have I moved it? Negative 7 means I've moved it 7 units to the right. And they now want the equation of the new axis of symmetry. Axis of symmetry for our parabola. Remember, the axis of symmetry is the x value of your turning point. So for R1, our axis of symmetry was x equals negative a half. If I'm now moving 7 units to the right, so if I'm taking this negative half and I'm moving it 7 right, if I add 7 to it, I will get that the new axis of symmetry will be at x is equal to 6, 
five. Two marks, and it was two marks for the answer. So what is an inverse function? The inverse of a function takes the y value or the range of this function to the corresponding x value or the domain and vice versa. Therefore, the x and y values are interchanged. The function is reflected along the line y equals x to form the inverse. Please note the notation that we use for an inverse function and make sure you do not confuse this with f prime which we use for calculus. So how do I obtain the equation of an inverse function? I swap the x and the y's. So if I give you a function f, which is y is equal to 2x minus 4, if I want to obtain the equation of the inverse, I interchange the x and the y's or I swap the x and the y's. This means everywhere in my equation where I get a y, I'm going to replace it with x. And everywhere where I get an x, I'm going to replace it with y. So my equation will change to x equals 2y minus 4. The next step is to make y the subject of the formula. So I get negative 2y equals negative x minus 4. And my final step is to ensure I write it in standard form. By dividing by negative 2, I get y equals negative a half x minus 2. And that would be the equation of my inverse function. So if we look at the exponential graph and its inverse function, if I give you fx equals 2 to the power of x, and I ask you to complete the table below, we've already generated the coordinates, that would be the coordinates I get. Then if I swap my x and my y values in my table, those would be my swapped coordinates. So from there, I can already draw the exponential graph and its inverse by just using the coordinates in my table. And those would be my two graphs. And you've seen I've also indicated the line y equals x, which is the reflection line. So how do I obtain the equation of the inverse? I start by writing down what was my original equation, y equals 2 to the power of x. Then I swap my x and my y coordinates, so x equals 2 to the power of y. And now I need to make y the subject of the formula. Please remember, if you have an exponential equation and you need to make the exponent, which in this case is y, the subject of the formula, you need to write it in logarithmic form. So y equals log x with a base of 2. Please ensure grade 12s, you are able to write your equations from exponential to logarithmic form and from logs to exponents. So what are the inverse graphs that I have to know? The first one is a straight line one, y equals mx plus c. Then I have two options for my parabola, depending on whether my a value is positive, I have a happy parabola, or my a value is negative, I've got a sad parabola. And then there's two options for my exponential graph. Remember the inverse of an exponential graph is a logarithmic graph. So please ensure you know, you know these. So what is a function? A function is for every x value, there is at most one y value. So how can I determine this? By doing a vertical line test. It means if I have a ruler and it only ever cuts the curve in one place, then the graph is a function. So if I look at my first example A, if I put a ruler on my parabola, it only cuts the function in one place. So a parabola is a function. If I look at the straight line graph and I put a ruler vertical on the graph, it only cuts the graph in one place. So a straight line is a function. If I have a circle and I put a ruler vertically on the graph, it cuts the graph in two places. So a circle is not a function. So grade 12s, to summarize quickly, if I have a parabola and I put a ruler on it to do the vertical line test, it only cuts it once, yes, it's a function. But the inverse of a parabola, you've got to be careful for. If you put a ruler on it, it cuts it twice. So the inverse is not a function. The only way to make the inverse a function is if you restrict the domain of the original function. So let's go look at our past papers and what they've asked. In November 2021, 
they gave us in question six the equation fx equals log of x with the base of four they've said is drawn below b is the coordinate k2 is a point on f and the first question they asked me is to calculate the value of k which means i could substitute it in and work it out so remember fx equals log x base of four means y equals the log of x with a base of four if you substitute in the coordinate k2 i'm going to say 2 equals log of k with a base of 4 so how can i now calculate k i have to write it from logarithmic form into exponential form so what does that mean it means 4 to the power of 2 equals k 4 to the power of 2 we know is 16 so k has a value of 16. You will see it counted two marks. So where did the two marks go? The mark went for the substitution and the answer. Question 6.3. They said, write down the equation of the inverse in the form y equals. So now I've got to write down the equation of the inverse. So let's start by writing down the original equation. fx equals log x with a base of 4. What does that mean? y equals log x with a base of 4. They want me to obtain the inverse. What's the first step in obtaining the inverse? It is to swap the x and the y's. So instead of y, I'm going to say x equals log y with a base of 4. So I've swapped my x and my y's. My second step, write it in standard form. How do I write it in standard form? Currently, I need to make y this sorry, I need to make y the subject of the formula. How do I make y the subject of the formula? I take it from a log and I write it into an exponent. So what does that mean? It's going to be 4 to the power of x equals y. Is y the subject of the formula now? Yes. Two marks. A mark for swapping the x and the y, and a mark for making y the subject of the formula if we go on to november 2020 question five this time they've given me the graph of fx equals three to the power of negative x is sketched below and they say A is the y-intercept, very important to read these instructions, of F. B is a point on the intersection of F and lies on the line y equals 9. 5.1. Write down the coordinates of A. They're asking me to write it down, so I should know this. Why are they asking A? It's the y-intercept. So you should know that the coordinate of A on an exponential graph, the y-intercept, would be 0, 1. If you didn't know it, how could you calculate it? It's the y-intercept. What do you know about the y-intercept? The x equals 0. So you could have gone y equals 3 to the power of negative sub in 0, and you would have gotten 1 as well. So it's the coordinate 0, 1. One mark just for the answer. 5.2. Determine the coordinates of b. So what do I know about b? b lies on the exponential graph but it also lies on the line y equals 9. So by b, I don't know what the x value is, but I know the y value. The y value is 9. And I also know it's on my exponential graph, so I can substitute it in. What is the equation of my exponential graph again? y equals 3 to the power of negative x. So I know the y is 9 equals 3 to the power of negative x. 9, if I write it, I can break it up as 3 to the power of 2 equals 3 to the power of negative x. If my bases are equal, my exponents have to be equal. So 2 is equal to negative x, so x is equal to negative 2. So b is the coordinate negative 2, 9. 
Remember the question said determine the coordinate. So make sure you answer the question and you write down the coordinate at the end. It was three marks. So a mark for making the equation equal to nine. A mark for breaking up the basis and for calculating x. Question 5.3. They're asking me, write down the domain of, be careful, the inverse. They're asking the domain of the inverse. We do not have the inverse function in our sketch. We have the original. But what do I know about inverse functions? The x and the y's swap. So the domain of the inverse will be the range of the original one. What is the range of our fx graph? It's all the y's greater than 0. Remember, we can't be equal to 0. So what would be the domain of the inverse? The domain would be all the x's greater than 0. Or remember, it doesn't matter in what notation you write it, just as long as you make sure you use the correct brackets and you only have greater than 0. So this was two marks only for the answer. There we go. November 2019. They gave us, it was also question five. And they gave us the graph below, fx is equal to k to the power of x. And they told me that the k value is greater than zero. And that the point 416 lies on f. The first question, 5.1. Determine the value of k. So how can I determine the value of k? Do I have a coordinate that lies on this graph? Yes, so I can substitute it in. So we know fx equals k to the power of x. And I have the coordinate for 16 on my graph, so I can substitute it in. Which means 16 equals k to the power of 4. So I'm asking you, what number to the power of 4 would give you? 16 and that would be k is equal to 2. If you struggle with this remember you can write it in logarithmic form and get the answer that way but we know that k would be 2 so that was two marks a mark for the substitution and a mark for the answer. 5.2 the graph g is obtained by reflecting f about the line y equals x. Remember, a reflection in the line y equals x is the inverse. Determine the equation of g. Okay, so what is the equation of f? We have y equals, what did we work up was k? 2 to the power of x. Now I have to get the equation of the inverse. So if I want the inverse, how do I get the inverse again? I start by swapping the x and the y. So I'm going to go x equals 2 to the power of y. And now I need to make y the subject of the formula. How do I do that? This is an exponential equation, which means I've got to write it in logarithmic form. So I'm going to say y equals log of x with a base of 2. Was a two more question? Where are the two marks? Swapping the x and the y and determining and making y the subject of the formula. Question 5.3. For four marks, sketch the graph of g. Remember, this was g. This is our inverse. Indicate on your graph the coordinates of two points on g. Very important to read the instructions. Okay, so if I'm going to sketch my inverse, I start by indicating my x and my y axis. What do I know about an inverse? The x and the y coordinates swap. So if I look on my original graph, I've got the coordinate 0, 1. That becomes the coordinate 1, 0. My coordinates swap. I have the coordinate 4, 16 on my original graph. So that would become 16, 4. Also, on my original graph, the x-axis is an asymptote which means I do not touch it so if I swap it the y-axis would be the asymptote I do not touch it so how would the graph of my inverse look it would look like that how is that four marks 
a mark that you've got you're approaching the y-axis and not touching it it's the asymptote a mark for your shape and then one for each of your coordinates it could have been any two coordinates grade 12s if we move on to november 2018 here it was in question four They said, in the graph below, the graph of fx equals a to the power of x squared is drawn in the interval only for the x's small or equal to zero. So it's a parabola, but it's only drawn for the x's small or equal to zero. The graph of the inverse is also drawn. P, the coordinate negative 6, negative 12, is a point on f, and R is a point on the inverse. 4.1, our first question. Is the inverse a function? Motivate your answer. So if you look on your graph, is your inverse a function? If you put a ruler on it, would it pass the vertical line test? Yes. So yes, the inverse is a function. And you could have said it passes the vertical line test. Passes the vertical line test. Or you could have said that for every x value, there's only one corresponding y value. It does not matter. You can either say pass vertical line test or for every x value, only one corresponding y value. Two marks, a mark for yes and a mark for your reason. Question 4.2. If R is the reflection of P in the line y equals x, write down the coordinates of R for only one mark. Remember, reflection in the line y equals x is my inverse. It means my x and my y's swap. So p is negative 6, negative 12. So r, if I swap it, would be negative 12, negative 6. One mark for my answer. 4.3. Calculate the values of a. Where is a again? It's in the equation of fx. So I have fx equals a times x squared. What does that mean? y equals ax squared. Do you have a coordinate on the graph f that you can substitute in? Yes, you've got p. It was the coordinate negative 6, negative 12. So if I substitute that in, I should be able to calculate a. So negative 12 equals a times negative 6 squared. Please remember when you substitute to do it in brackets. So negative 12 equals 36a. And if I now divide, I get a equals negative a third. And I've calculated my value of a. Two marks. So it was a mark for the substitution and then a mark for the answer. Question 4.4. For three marks, write down the equation of the inverse. So let's start. What do we know? fx is now, a we worked out was negative a third times x squared. So if I want the inverse, remember this means y equals negative a third times x squared. So if I want the inverse, how do I start again? By swapping my x and my y's. So I'm going to go x equals negative a third y squared and now i need to make y the subject of the formula i'd have to start to start by dividing by negative three a third so that's negative three x equals y squared and I, to get rid of a power of two i have to take the square root so it's the square root of negative three x equals y please remember when you take a square root it's a plus minus in front and now you have to go look on your graph. There's two very important things to note here. First of all, if you look on your graph, you'll notice it's only, for this sketch, it's only the negative y's. So I only have to use the negative ones. Negative the square root of minus 3x equals y. But there's a second limitation to this question. Please remember, you can never have a negative under a square root. So how do I solve that? How would I solve that the answer under the square root would be positive? I can only use the negative 
x's because a negative times a negative would make the bottom of the square root a positive. So all the x's I use have to be smaller or equal to 0. This question counted three marks. A mark for swapping the x and the y's. Then a mark for making, dividing by negative 3. And then the final mark was at the bottom where you put in the limitations or the restrictions. Grade 12s, you are guaranteed a question in the calculus section. And it will be the first question. And then they will say, derive from first principles. If you get this, you have to use the formula. Please, the formula is on your formula sheet. Ensure you write it down correctly. What does it say? If prime x equals the limit of h approaching 0 of what? f of x plus h minus fx over h. So let's go look at the question paper. In November 2021, the first question in the calculus section was said, was given, determine f prime x, please do not confuse this with inverse, this is calculus, f prime x, from first principles, if it is given that fx is equal to 2x squared minus 3x. Grade 12, if they say from first principles, you have to use the formula. So what is the formula? It's on my formula sheet, f prime x equal. Please pay attention to where the equal is. Then the limit of h approaching 0, it's after the equal sign, of what? f of x plus h minus fx, everything over h. Now I can break the sum up to make it a little bit easier for me. I'm first going to go calculate what is f of x plus h. What does that mean? It means in my original formula in my original equation of fx, I must go replace x with an x plus h. So I'm going to say 2. And instead of x squared in a bracket, I'm going to substitute in x plus h squared. Minus 3x. So minus 3 instead of x in a bracket, x plus h. And let's go and multiply that out. Grade 12s, please remember x plus h squared means you've got the bracket twice. If you are proficient at multiplying out the bracket without writing it out twice, you're welcome to do it. If you are scared you're going to make a mistake, rather write the bracket out twice. So if I multiply my brackets first, that's x squared plus xh plus xh is plus 2xh plus h squared. I'm going to multiply the negative 3 into the second bracket. So that's negative 3x minus 3h. I still have to multiply my 2 into the first one. So that's 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3x minus 3h. And I look at that and there's no like terms to add up. So I've done the f of x plus h. What at the top of the fraction say? I've got to take f of x plus h and I've got to subtract fx. So let's go do that. I've got to take f of x plus h and I've got to subtract fx. I just calculated f of x plus h. I just calculated it. It was 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3x minus 3h. What I've got to do? I've got to subtract what do I have to subtract from it? The fx equation. But remember, you are subtracting, so please, a bracket. What is the fx equation? 2x squared minus 3x. Okay, let's go get rid of our bracket first. So 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3x minus 3h minus 2x squared, a negative and a negative makes a positive 3x. Let's go see, like terms, 2x squared minus 2x squared cancels, minus 3x plus 3x cancels, so all I've got left is 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3h. So I've now completed the top of the equation. The top of the fraction. So let's go write down the equation again. 
from first principles, my formula said f of f prime x equals then the limit of h approaching zero. What do I have to have at the top of the fraction? f of x plus h. I've got to subtract from it fx and everything must be over h. Remember, I've now already calculated this. Very important in this question, grade 12, do not drop that limit yet. You have to write it down and don't drop the equal sign either. They will penalize you on your notation in this question. So equals the limit of h approaching 0. I've already calculated this. I've done it right here. So I can say it's f 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3h squared every sorry minus 3h everything over h now if i look at the top of the fraction i'm going to take out the common factor what common factor am i going to take out i'm only going to take out h so that i can cancel it with the h at the bottom of the fraction please remember don't forget the equal sign then the limit of h approaching zero i'm going to take out a common factor of h so it gives me 4x plus 2h minus 3, everything over h. Why did I only take out the h? So that those can cancel. So if I have cancelled that, what am I left with? The limit equals the limit of h approaching 0 of 4x plus 2h minus 3. So what does this mean? It means h is getting closer and closer to 0. It never actually reaches 0, but it gets so close that it, this term will fall away. So what's 2 times 0? Zero? 0. It gets so close. It's not really 0, but it's so close we can say it's almost 0. So that will fall away. So what do I have left? 4x minus 3. You would have seen that this was a 5 mark question. So where were the 5 marks allocated? First mark was allocated for substituting in the x plus h. And then for calculating what is f of x plus h. Your next mark is for subtracting them. Then for taking out your common factor of h. And your last mark is your final answer where you've said, okay, now the limit of h has approached 0, so I don't need it in front anymore. And it's 4x minus 3. Grade 12s, please pay close attention when you are doing this question to where your equal sign is and that you keep the limit of h approaching 0 all the way till the second last step. When we are determining the first derivatives by using the rules, if they give me y equals a times x to the power of n, then the first derivative dy over dx will be a n times x to the power of n minus 1. Very important in this section, grade 12, is our notation. If they give me fx equals 4x to the power of 3, then my first derivative, f prime x, equals 12x to the power of 2. How did I get that? 3 times 4 is 12. 3 minus 1 is 2. Please remember this is called f prime x. Please pay close notation to the close attention to the notation in this section. If the equation is given to you as y equals 4x to the power of 3, then the notation for the first derivative is dy over dx. If they give me dx in brackets 4x to the power of 3, then the notation for the first derivative is just equal. There is nothing in front of it. And the same if they give me d over dx. They're asking me the first derivative of 4x to the power of 3, then it's just equals 12x squared. Great 12s, please make sure you pause this slide and you're unsure of your notation because notation can cost you marks in this section. So if we go to past papers in November 2021, Great 12s, unless they tell you to use first principles, we don't. We only use first principles if they tell me. If they just ask me to determine, I can use my derivative rules. So by question 9.2.1, they told me I must determine dy over dx if y is equal to 4x to the power of 5 minus 6x to the power of 4 plus 3x. So 
What would my notation be for my first derivative? It would be dy over dx. So what would my first derivative be? 4 times 5 is 20. x to the power of 5 minus 1 is 4. Next term. 4 times negative 6 is negative 24. x to the power of 4 minus 1 is 3. Last term, remember the exponent is 1. 1 times 3 is 3. x to the power of 1 minus 1 is 0, so no x's left. 3 marks, it was a mark for each of the correct terms. Question 9.2.2, they told you dx. You see we now have a different notation. And they've given me negative the cube root of x over 2 plus in brackets 1 over 3x everything squared. Before I can get the derivative with this one I must first get rid of the cube root and I also don't want to work with a fraction. So I'm going to say first of all I haven't gotten the derivative yet so I'm keeping dx. I need to write this I don't want to work with a cube root. I want to write it as an exponent. So it's negative x to the power of what? 1 over 3. Everything over 2. Plus, remember the square belongs to both. 1 squared is 1. 3 squared is 9. x squared is x squared. Another easy trick would be, instead of writing like it as negative x to the power of 3 over 2, I can say... What is the number in front of the x? It is 1. So that means it's negative a half x to the power of a third. I don't want to work with an x at the bottom of a fraction. I need to bring it up. So I'm going to say plus 1 over 9. And if the x comes up, it's x to the power of negative 2. And now I can only get my first derivative. What did I have to do? I had to get rid of the cube root. I had to write it as an exponent. And I didn't want to work with an x at the bottom of a fraction in the denominator. I had to bring it up. Now I'm going to get my first derivative. What is my notation now? Just an equal. So a half times a third. You can use your calculator. It's negative a sixth. x to the power of a third minus 1 is minus 2 over 3. Grade 12, so you do not have to give your final answer with positive exponents in this section. Now, negative 2 times 1 over 9, that's negative 2 over 9. x to the power of negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. So, where did our marks go? This was a 4 mark question. It was a mark for getting to negative a half times x to the power of a third. And the plus 1 over 9, x to the power of negative 2. And then the mark for each one of the first derivatives. If we look at November 2020, same again, question 7.2.1. They just say determine, so I can use the rules. I do not have to use first principles. And they've given me d over dx. Pay attention to no notation, please. They've given me the fifth root of x squared plus x to the power of 3. So before I can get the first derivative, I first need to get rid of this root. Remember, I'm not getting the first derivative yet, so I'm keeping my d over dx. So what would that be as an exponent? x to the power of 2 over 5. That would be my first step. Plus x to the power of 3. So now it's solved. Now I can go get my first derivative. If I get my first derivative, what is my notation yet? It will just be equal. 2 over 5 times 1 is 2 over 5. x to the power of 2 over 5 minus 1 is minus 3 over 5. Remember, I don't have to give the exponent in this section as a positive one, so I can leave it like that. Second term, 3 times 1 is 3, so plus 3. x to the power of 3 minus 1 is 2. This counted 3 marks. It was a mark for writing the third into an exponential form, that x to the power of 2 over 5, and then a mark for each of the terms that you got the first derivative of. Question 
Determine if prime x, if fx, is equal to 4x squared minus 9 over 4x plus 6. If you look at this question, you should recognize that the top of the fraction, the numerator is two terms, and the denominator is two terms, which means I've got to factorize first. Okay, so if I factorize before I go get my first derivative, the top is a difference of two squares, so that's 2x plus 3 and 2x minus 3. At the bottom of the fraction, I can take out a common factor of 2, and that would be 2x plus 3. And if I did this correctly, something would cancel, so yes, I can cancel. So fx is 2x minus 3 over 2. I cannot go get my first derivative yet. I need to write this as two separate fractions. So let's break it up. What does that mean? It means it's 2x over 2 minus 3 over 2. You can simplify this. 2 over 2 is 1. So it's x minus 3 over 2. And now I can go get my first derivative. So f prime x equals 1 times 1 is 1. For my x's, 1 minus 1 is 0, so no x's left. There is no x's here to get the derivative from, so your answer is only 1. This was a 4 mark question. It was a mark for the factors, a mark for the factors, and a mark for the simplification. And then a mark for your final answer. November 2019. Let's go look at what they asked that year. They gave me, in question 7.2, they said determine dy over dx if y is equal to 4x to the power of 8 plus the square root of x to the power of 3. So before I can get my first derivative, once again, what must I do? I must get rid of the square root. So I'm going to say y equals 4x to the power of 8 plus x to the power of what? 3 over 2. So that problem is solved. Now I can get my first derivative. What is my notation? dy over dx. 4 times 8 is 32. x to the power of 8 minus 1 is 7. 3 over 2 times 1 is 3 over 2 or 1 and a half. It doesn't matter if you write it as a fraction or a decimal. x to the power of 3 over 2 minus 1 is a half. Three mark questions. Where were the three marks? The first one for getting rid of the square root and then a mark for each of the derivatives. Remember they will penalize you if you get your notation wrong. Question 7.3. They've given me y equals ax squared plus a. And this was a little bit of a higher order question to see if you understand what they are asking. So the first question, they ask me dy over dx, which means I must get the derivative of x. Derivative of x. So we can do that. There's nothing for me to change here. 2 times a is 2a. x to the power of 2 minus 1 is 1. I don't have to write the 1. Are there any x's here to get the derivative from? No. That's why it's only a one more question. Done. 7.3.2, they ask you dy over dA. So you've got to get the derivative in terms of A and not in terms of X. So now I'm doing the derivative in terms of A. So what is the number, what is the exponent of 1, of A? 1. 1 times X squared is X squared. And 1 minus 1 is Zero, so no a is left. For the last second term, or the last term, 1 times 1 is 1, so plus 1. a to the power of 1 minus 1 is 0, no a is left. Two marks. It is a mark for the one for each of the terms. So grade 12s, please ensure you know the difference, what they're asking. dy over dx means get the derivative of x in terms of x. dy over dA means I had to get it in terms of 
a so i had to use the exponents of the a's and not the exponents of the x's 2018 They gave us two questions in 2018, and they said determine dy over dx, so it's a normal one. And in 8.2.1, they gave me y equals 3x to the power of 3 plus 6x squared plus x minus 4. There's nothing special about this one. There's nothing I have to fix yet. So I can do it immediately. dy over dx equals 3 times 3, 9. x to the power of 3 minus 1 is 2. 6 times 2 is 12, so plus 12. x to the power of 2 minus 1 is 1. The exponent by the x is 1. 1 times 1 is 1, so plus 1. x to the power of 1 minus 1 falls away. It's 0. Can't differentiate the last one. It has no x's. Three marks, a mark for each of the terms. Question 8.2.2, you'll see now counts four marks, which should give it away that there's a little bit more to do to it. Yx minus y equals 2x squared minus x. And they told me x is not equal to 1. Remember they said I must get dy over dx, which means I must get the derivative in terms of x. So first of all, I only wanted to say y equal. So on the left, I first need to take out the common factor, which is y. So I get x minus 1 equals 2x squared minus x. If I now make y the subject of the formula, y equals 2x squared minus x divided by x minus 1. And now you will see this is one like one of the previous examples we did. I've got a fraction. The numerator has got two terms in it, so I need to factorize it. The denominator has already been done, so that's fine. At the top, what can I do? I can take out and two. Sorry, grade 12, so I see I made a mistake. That's supposed to be 2x. I left out the 2 there, so let's just write it back. I can take out a common factor of 2x. That gives me x minus 1 over x minus 1. And that works, so now I can cancel. So I get y is equal to 2x. Have I done the derivative yet? No. So now I can go get dy over dx. 1 times 2 is 2. x to the power of 1 minus 1 is 0. No x is left, so my answer is 2. So where did the four marks go? First, we're taking out the common y is a common factor on the left. Then for taking out the 2x as a factor on the right and getting it into standard form. And finally, for calculating your first derivative. If I ask you to write down the values of x for which fx is greater than 0, or I ask you is fx smaller than or equal to 0, grade 12s, I'm referring to the y values. fx refers to the y values. So if I look at my cubic graph and I start reading it from the left, my y values are negative for all the values of x until x equals to negative 2. Then my y value is 0. If I continue walking my graph, I'll see my y values is positive all the way again until where x equals 3. Then my y is 0. And after that, my y values are positive again. So for which values is fx greater than 0? Well, that is not too difficult to answer. It's all the x's greater than negative 2, but I've got to be careful. They only asked greater than 0. They didn't say equal to 0. So I've got to exclude where x is equal to 3. So I've got to say x not equal to 3. It must be excluded. If I ask you where is fx small or equal to 0, so where are the y values negative? Those are all our x's smaller than negative 2. But remember, we've now included equal to 0, so now you've got to add, you must also have x is equal to 3. So what is the other way of asking this? What if I ask you where f prime x is greater than 0? So I'm asking you where the first derivative is greater than 0, or I can ask you for what values of x is f prime x smaller than 0? So where's the first derivative smaller than 0? 
When I refer to the first derivative, I'm talking about the gradient. So f prime x refers to the gradient and not the y values. So now I've got to look at the gradient of this graph. If I once again start on the left, my graph has got a positive gradient all the way till my turning point where x is negative a third and there my gradient is zero. Then if I walk my graph, I've got a negative gradient all the way again until my turning point of x is equal to 3. And then my gradient is positive again after that. So if I ask you, where is f prime x greater than 0? So where's the first derivative greater than 0? It is all the x's smaller than negative a third, smaller than the first turning point, or all the x's greater than 3 after the second turning point. If I ask you where's the first derivative f prime x smaller than 0, where do I have a negative gradient? That is the section between negative a third and 3, so it's the x's between negative a third and 3. Please note there's no equals underneath here because we had no equals in our inequality. So let's go look at past papers. Great, Paul. So we're only going to look at the sections of the papers that apply to the increasing and decreasing part. If we look at November 2020, in question 8.1, they asked me for what values of x will g be increasing? So they're asking me where is this graph an increasing function? They're not talking about g of x, they're asking me where is this graph increasing? So if I walk my graph from the left, my graph is decreasing all the way till my turning point where x is negative 1. Then my graph starts increasing all the way till my second turning point where x is 2 and then I decrease again. They are looking for the increasing part, so it's everything from the first turning point where x was negative 1 to the second turning point where x was 2. So how would I write this down? I would say, okay, it is all my x's between negative 1 and 2. Remember, you can use either notation, it doesn't matter, just make sure that if whatever notation you're using, that you have the correct inequality or brackets. It was two marks, so it's two marks just for the answer. If you go look at June 2022, this was a question that was just asked in the rewrite, and we're going to go look at question 9.3.1 and 9.3.2. They tell me for which values of f of x is fx smaller than 0. So first of all, we have not done, not done the rest of the question. But in 9.1, they've given me the equation. So let's go write that down. fx is equal to x to the power of 3 minus x squared minus 5x minus 3. Remember, in question 9.1, they asked you to show this. If you could not show it, you can use this answer to answer the rest of the questions. So what does this say? fx smaller than 0. fx refers to the y, so I want to know where's the y's negative. So if I look at my graph from the left, my y's are negative, 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 negative. m is my turning point, there my y is 0. And then negative, 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 all the way again until I cut the x-axis at 3. So I need to know what that coordinate by m is because that's a turning point and my y is 0 there and I can't include it. How do I calculate the values of my turning points again? It is where my first derivative is equal to 0. But I do have my equation. So let's go calculate our first derivative. That would be 3x squared minus 2x minus 5. And to determine my turning points, I know it's where the first derivative is equal to 0. So it's where 3x squared minus 2x minus 5 is equal to 0. And now I've got a trinomial I can factorize. You can either factorize this normally, or remember if you're struggling to factorize, you're welcome to use the quadratic formula. You just have to show your substitution. If I factorize this normally, I get my two brackets is 3x minus 5 and x plus 1 equal to 0, which means x is equal to 5 over 3 or x is equal to negative 1. 
So if I just very quickly redraw the sketch for us, just so we can see what that means. The sketch they gave to me looked like that. That was M, N, and this was the coordinate 3. X is equal to 5 over 3 would be the X value by N. So please make use of your sketch to determine which one belongs there. And X is equal to negative 1 would be by M. The question asked, for which values of X will FX be smaller than 0? We said if we walk our graph, we are negative all the way, except by the turning point with 0. We're negative all the way. That turning point's also negative. And when X is equal to 3, that's 0 again. And then we become positive. So for what X values is FX smaller than 0? It's all the X's smaller than 3. So it's the X's smaller than 3. But remember, I cannot include 0 because they did not include 0. So I must add in X cannot be equal to negative. 1. And this was 2 marks. So where's the 2 marks? 1, 2. Question 9.3.2. They're asking us, where is F be, for what values of F, for what values of X will F be increasing? So where will my graph be increasing? So now I've got to go look. When they're talking about increasing, they're talking about the gradient. So let's go look at our gradient. We start on the left. My gradient is increasing until my turning point, then my gradient is zero. Here my gradient is negative all the way till my turning point where my gradient is zero, and then my gradient is increasing again. So for which x values will my graph be increasing? It's all the x's smaller than negative one. Or, remember not and, or, or the x's greater than, what was my x value there? 5 over 3. Two marks once again. Where did the two marks go? 1, 2. Please remember it's an or question and not an and. To determine concavity, we need to know the inflection point of a function. So what is the definition of an inflection point of a function? An inflection point is a point on a continuous function where the function changes from being concave up to concave down and vice versa. So in, in differential calculus, an inflection point is a point on the curve in which the curve changes, like we said, from being concave up to concave down. So let's look at some examples of how can we ask this. If I give you fx equals x bracket x minus 3 squared, please remember to first write it in standard form. So you can multiply it out and you would get it's x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x. And I ask you to determine the coordinate of the point of inflection of f. What do we know about a point of inflection? It is where the second derivative is equal to 0. So you start off by writing down your first derivative, which would be 3x squared minus 12x plus 9. And then I've got to go get my second derivative, which would be 6x minus 12. Why do I know? My second derivative has to be equal to 0. And then I can solve my equation and x is calculated to be 2. So the x coordinate of the point of inflection for this graph is 2. So what does that look like on the graph? Where x is 2, that is my point of inflection. That is where my graph will change from concave down to concave up in this scenario. So our second example, for which values of x is f concave down? Now I'm asking you, where is this function concave down? So how would we calculate this? First of all, for concave down, my second derivative must be smaller than 0. So what was our first derivative again? 3x squared minus 12x plus 9. If I now go calculate my second derivative, it's 6x minus 12. For concave down, this must be smaller than 0, which means 6x must be smaller than 12, and x must be smaller than 2. Remember we said at x equals 2, our concavity changes. So at all the x values smaller than 2, this graph will be concave down. 
So how else can I ask you this question? I can ask you, what can you tell me about the concavity at the point where x equals a half? So now you've got to tell me something about the concavity of this graph where x equals a half. How would we approach this? We would go substitute a half into our second derivative. What was our second derivative again? 6x minus 12. If you go substitute a half in x's place, you will get an answer of negative 9. Is that answer equal to 0, less than 0, or bigger than 0? That answer is less than 0. And what do we know if the answer is less than 0? The graph is concave down. So we write down the answer is less than 0. It means we know that this point, the graph is concave down. I can also ask you, what can you tell me about this graph, at the about the concavity of this graph at the point where x equals 2? So we go do the same thing. We take the second derivative. The moment I talk about concavity, we work with the second derivative, and I go substitute in 2. 6 times 2 minus 12 gives me 0. What do I know if the second derivative is equal to 0? That this is the point of inflection, and this will be the point where the graph changes concavity. Or I can ask you, what can you tell me about the concavity of this graph at the point where x is equal to 4? So we follow the same procedure. We say in our second derivative, we're going to substitute in 4. 6 times 4 minus 12, and I get an answer of 12. This answer is greater than 0. So what does that mean? At this point, the graph is concave up. So to summarize, in our previous example, when we used x equals a half, and I substituted it into my second derivative, I got an answer of less than 0, which means the graph was concave down. When I substituted in 2, I got 0, which was where my graph changes concavity. And when I substituted in 4, I got an answer greater than 0, which means my graph was concave up. So how is another way we can ask you this question? I can tell you to show me that the concavity of f changes at x equals 2. So now you've got to show it. So how would I approach this? First of all, I would go work out my first derivative. 3x squared minus 12x plus 9. Then my second derivative is 6x minus 12. So what do I know about the x value of 2? If I substitute in a number smaller than 2, I get the answer of less than 0. If I substitute in a number bigger than 2 in the second derivative, I get an answer of bigger than 0, which means at 2, the concavity changes. How would you get marks for this? You would get a mark for linking the second derivative with the concavity, a mark for getting the second derivative of 6x minus 12, and then for our explanation. I can also ask you to explain the significance of the change in the previous question with respect to f. So, what is the significance of x equals 2? It is a point of inflection. So please make sure you know the difference in how they can ask these questions. So if we go look at some previous exa examples, we're not going to go through the entire question. We're only going to focus on the parts that's got to do with concavity. So if I look at November 2020 in question 8, in question 8.2, they asked me to write down the x-coordinate of the point of inflection of g. If I look at what they've given me, They've given me gx equals ax to the power of 3 plus bx squared plus cx. I haven't worked that out yet, so I don't know what a, b, and c is. But 8.2, they're just asking me, I must write it down. They don't even ask me to calculate it. Write down the x-coordinate of the point of inflection of g. Great 12s, if I had the equation, I could get the second derivative and make it equal to 0. But I don't. What do I have on my graph? I've got the two turning points. Very important, your point of inflection is exactly halfway between your two turning points. So what do you know for your two turning points? The one x value is negative 1. The other x value is 2. If I want to know which number is exactly halfway, negative 1 plus 2, and I divide it by 2. 
I get it's a half. So the point, the x value of the point of inflection will be at a half. Do you see it was two marks? A mark for our method and a mark for our answer. Question 8.3. For which values of x will the g graph be concave down? I now know my point of inflection is a half. I can look at my graph and that would be all the x values greater than a half because this graph is concave down on the right. That's our concave down section. So it's all the x values greater than a half. Remember, not equal to. Two marks. If we go look at June 2020, you will see this was just asked. Once again, we're not going to do the entire question. We're just going to use look at the section pertaining to concavity. They tell me 9.3 for which values of x will, and we're going to look at 9.3.3, f be concave up. So let's go see what they've given us so far that we can use. They've given me fx equals x to the power of 3 plus ax squared plus bx plus c. And do they, you see that in question 9.1 they said show that this is the equation. So even if you couldn't get the answer, you can still use it now. They've told me to show it. So in 9.1 they've given me the final equation x to the power of 3 minus x squared minus 5x minus 3. Very important tip grade 12s. If you cannot get the equation but they've asked you to show it, you can use it in the next questions. So I now have to show for which values of x will this graph be concave up. Concavity has got to do with my second derivative. So let's start. Our first derivative, f prime x would be 3x squared minus 2x minus 5. Our second derivative would be 6x minus 2. What do I know? They're asking me concave up. For concave up, my second derivative must be greater than 0. So that's where 6x is greater than 2 and x is greater than a third. This question counted three marks. Where did the three marks go? It went for calculating the second derivative, saying you know it's greater than zero, and then getting our final answer that x is greater than a third. If we move over to November 2018. In November 2018, once again, we're only going to look at 9.1.3 for now. They ask me, is this, is the graph concave up or concave down at 0, 20? So we've now got to show them whether this graph is concave up or concave down. Show all your calculations. Once again, let's go see what they've given us that we can use. They've given me gx is x to the power of 3 plus bx squared plus cx plus d. And we haven't done question 9.1.1 in this video, but they have said show that b is 1, c is negative 16, and d is 20, which means I can use it in the next questions. So I know it's x to the power of 3 plus x squared minus 16x plus 20. So how would I approach this? I must now go show that the, whether this is concave up or concave down at 0, 20. So let's start by getting my first derivative. That would be 3x squared plus 2x minus 16. Concavity is linked to my second derivative, so I have to go get my second derivative. That would be 6x plus 2. What do I know? That I must show whether it's concave up or concave down. Let's go get the point of inflection. So at the point of inflection, my second derivative is equal to 0, which means 6x is plus 2 is equal to 0, so 6x is equal to negative 2, so x is negative a third. That would be my point of inflection. They're asking me about the coordinate 0, 20. So when x is 0, if you look on your graph, when x is 0, is that before or after x equals negative a third? It's the ones after which means you can see that this graph would be concave 
up. So I can say for 0, 20, the x's are bigger than negative a third. So that means at 0, 20, the graph is concave up. There was a second way you could have done this. After you got your second derivative, you couldn't, could have taken your second derivative, which we got was the second derivative was 6x plus 2, and we could have gone and subbed in 0 to see what happens. So we could have said, okay, what happens if I sub in 0? 6 times 0 plus 2 gives me 2. This answer is greater than 0, which means this graph must be concave up. Two ways to show it. Where would the marks have gone? It's a mark if you use the first method. For the second derivative, calculating the point of inflection, and then for your explanation, if you use the second method, second derivative, for substituting in the zero and getting an answer bigger than two, zero, and then your final conclusion. June 2019. Once again, we're not going to do the entire question. We're only going to look at the part that's got to do with concavity. By 5.2.5a, They've given me, they asked me, for which values of x will the graph g be concave up? So let's just read through what they've given us. They've given me the graph of kx equals ax squared plus bx plus c. hx is negative 2x plus 4. They've said k is the turning point, negative 118. And we can see it's a parabola. And s is the x-intercept of h and k. Graphs h and k also intersect at point t. At the start of question 5.2.5, they tell me it is further given that k is the graph of the first derivative of g. So remember, we don't have a g graph in this picture. We've got a k graph and a h graph. And they are asking me where will the g graph, the one that's not in the picture, will be concave up. But what have they told me? They've told me that k is the first derivative of that one. So the first derivative of a cubic graph is always a parabola. So how will I now know when the first when the graph will be concave up? It will be where the parabola is increasing. For which values of x is the parabola increasing? The parabola is increasing for all the x values smaller than negative 1. Good point to remember, if they've given you a sketch of the first derivative, how do I know where the point of inflection is? It's where the parabola is increasing for concave up. And if they ask you where it's concave down, it's where the parabola is decreasing. Two marks just for the answer. When drawing a cubic graph, we need to pay attention to a few things. The equation of a cubic graph is fx equals ax to the power of 3, plus bx squared, plus cx, plus d. We need three things to draw our graph. Our x-intercept, by making y equal to 0. Our y-intercept, we can get by making x equal to 0. And we need our turning point, and for that we make our first derivative equal to 0. So what else do we need to pay attention to? The shape of our graph. If a is positive, or is a is negative, we've got two different shapes. Please make sure you know what shape your graph is going to be. To determine our x-intercept, we must be able to factorize. And to determine the turning point, we must be able to get the derivative. I can also ask you to determine the equation of a graph. Grade 12, so we can give you three different types. I can either, gi either give you a graph with all three x-intercepts indicated, and we'll go a e y equals a, x minus the first x-intercept, x minus the second one, or x minus the third one. Or we can give you a graph with one x-intercept indicated and the second x-intercept is a turning point, which means that x-intercept repeats. So the form you will use is y equals a x minus the first x-intercept and x minus the second one, the one that's repeating squared. Or we can give you a graph where we only indicate the turning points. So let's go look at our past papers. In November 2021, what did they ask me? They gave us the following. They said the graph of hx is equal to ax to the power of 3 
plus bx squared is drawn. The graph has a turning point at the origin, 0, 0, and one at b, the coordinate 4, 32. A is the x-intercept of h. Question 10.1. Show that a is negative 1, so I've got to go show a, and that b is 6. So let's go look. What have they given me on the graph? Have they given me all three x-intercepts? One x-intercept and a turning point, or have they only given me a turning point? They've given me the turning point. So I've got to work from that point. What do I know about a turning point? At a turning point, the first derivative is equal to 0. So let's go get the first derivative. That would be 3 times a is 3a. x to the power of 3 minus 1 is 2. 2 times b is plus 2b. x to the power of 2 minus 1 is 1. We know at the turning point, the first derivative must be equal to 0. If you look on your sketch, you know the x value at the turning point. You know the x value is 4. So you know at your first derivative, if you substitute in 4, you must get a 0. So let's go and do that. I'm going to substitute 4 into my equation. So 3a times 4 squared plus 2b times 4 must be equal to 0. If I go simplify, that gives me 48a plus 8b is equal to 0. I'm going to make b the subject of the formula in this scenario. So 8b equals negative 48a. So b is equal to negative 6a. And now I'm stuck. So what can I do next? What else do I have on my graph? This coordinate of 432, it's not just the turning point, it's also a coordinate on the function. So I know it belongs to hx as well. So if I substitute 4 into my original graph, I must get an answer of 32. So let's go do that. a times 4 to the power of 3 plus b times 4 squared must give me an answer of 32. If I simplify, 64a plus 16b is equal to 32. And now I have got two equations. So I can substitute equation 1 into equation 2. What does that mean? In equation 2, everywhere where I see a b, I'm going to replace it with a negative 6a. So I'm going to go 64a plus 16 instead of b, negative 6a equals 32. Let's multiply out. 64a, 16 times negative 6 is negative 96a equals 32. 64a minus 96 is minus 32a equals 32. So a is equal to negative 1. Let's go look at our question again. Show that a is negative 1. I've got that. And I've got to show b is 6. So I can go back to equation 1 and I can say, okay, b is equal to, what did we have? Negative 6 times a. So negative 6, we just calculated a was negative 1. So b is equal to 6. And there I have it. Where were the five marks allocated? The first one went for writing down the first derivative and then knowing if you substitute it in 4, you should get an answer of 0. And then for multiplying out that and simplification. The next mark went for knowing that if you substituted 4 into the original one, you should get an answer of 32. And then for multiplying that out. And those are our five marks. Why did they not give a mark for A equals negative 1 and B equals 6? Because it was given in the paper. But to obtain all five marks, you must finish the sum and show it. So you cannot just stop there. You must please make sure that you complete the sum and you show it. Question 10.2. In 10.2, they're asking me to calculate the coordinates of A. Now, grade 12s, if you were struggling with 10.1 and you could not get A is negative 1 and B is 6, use that answer in 10.2 because they've told you to show it. So you know A must be negative 1 and B must be 6. So if I take the original equation, hx equals ax to the power of 3 plus bx squared, I know, they've told me in 10.1, a must be negative 1, 
and that B must be 6. So please use that. So why are they asking me to calculate coordinate A? Coordinate A is an x-intercept. What do I know about the x-intercept? Y is equal to 0. So 0 equals negative 1x cubed plus 6x squared. And now I've got to go factorize. But I don't like factorizing with a negative in front. So I'm going to multiply everything with a negative. So 0 equals x to the power of 3 minus 6x squared. And now I can factorize. I can take out a common factor. So x squared brackets x minus 6. So that means x squared is equal to 0 or x minus 6 is equal to 0. The square root of 0 is 0 or x is equal to 6. If I now go back to my graph and I go and look at it, I'm supposed to have two x-intercepts. 0, it's already indicated for me. So a must be the one that is 6. So a is the coordinate 6, 0. Three marks. Where did the three marks go for making the equation equal to zero, for factorizing, and then for knowing that A was the one that is six, zero? Question 10.3. Write down the values of x, for x, of which h is increasing. Grade 12s, so there's a separate video you can go look at for increasing and decreasing graphs, but let's look at this quickly on this question. If I start walking my graph from the left, my graph is decreasing all the way till my turning point. Then my graph increases till my second turning point and then I decrease again. So where's this graph increasing between my two turning points? They said write down the values of x. So what are those x values? It's the x's greater than 0 or the x's smaller than 4. Remember, you could use another notation as well, just as long as you have your brackets or your inequalities correct. For this one, they also accepted it was the x is greater or equal to 0 or smaller or equal to 4, and then you had to use the square brackets. Great 12s, please make sure your notation is correct. In this question, they gave a mark that you had the 0 and the 4. They are called the critical values, so it was a mark for the critical values. And a mark then that your inequality signs were correct or your brackets were correct for your notation. Question 10.3.2. They're asking me for which values of x is h concave down. Once again, grade 12, so we do have a separate video on concave up and concave down. You are welcome to go and look at. What do I know about concave down? It's where my second derivative is smaller than 0. So let's go write down what do we know. hx is negative 1x to the power of 3 plus 6x squared. My first derivative would be 3 times negative 1 is negative 3x to the power of 3 minus 1 is 2. Positive 6 times 2 is plus 12x to the power of 2 minus 1 is 1. That would be my first derivative. My second derivative. So if I go do it again, 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. x to the power of 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 times positive 12 is 12. x to the power of 1 minus 1 is 0. So there's my second derivative. What do I know about concave down? My second derivative has to be smaller than 0. So it's when negative 6x is smaller than negative 12. Remember, when you divide by a negative number, your inequality sign changes. So it's where x is greater than 2. Where did they allocate the two marks for this question? It was a mark for the 2 and a mark that you changed the inequality sign. If we go on to November 2018. In November 2018, they gave us the following. They said the graph of gx is equal to x to the power of 3 plus bx squared plus cx plus d is sketched below. The graph of g intersects the x-axis at negative 5, 0 and at the point p. 
the y-axis at 0, 20, P and R are the turning points of G. Question 9.1.1. Show that B is 1, C is negative 16, and D is 20. So I've got to go get the equation. Let's go look. What did they give me? Did they give me three x-intercepts? No. Did they give me an x-intercept and one that's a turning point? Yes. So I've got to start with that form. So I'm going to go y equals, remember it's a, x minus the first x-intercept, x minus the second one, squared. But we know what's a. What is the a value? The a value is 1, so we don't have to worry about that. So y equals x minus, what is my first x-intercept? It's negative 5. A neg if I substitute in a negative, a negative and a negative makes a positive. And x minus the other x-intercept, I don't know. I'm going to go give it any letter I feel like. I'm going to go give it a K. Okay, what else do I know? I've got a coordinate on this graph. I've got in the coordinate 0, 20. So I'm going to substitute that in. So 20 equals, instead of X, 0 plus 5, and then 0 minus K squared. And I can solve this. 20 equals 5, bracket, 0 minus k is negative k and then squared. If I divide by 5, 4 is equal to negative k squared is k squared. If I take the square root, k can be positive or negative 2. So let's go see. Is this going to be the k could have been positive 2 or negative 2? Let's go see. What would that x-intercept by p have been? Would it have been a positive 2 or a negative 2? It would have been a positive 2. So my k value had to be 2. So now I can go back here and I know my equation would be y equals x plus 5 and x minus 2 squared. And I can go multiply it out and get it in standard form. Please remember the second bracket is squared. That means you've got the bracket twice. If you can do it in your head, you are welcome to. Otherwise, rather write the bracket out twice so you make sure you don't forget about the middle term. If I multiply out my brackets, I'm going to start by my bracket that was squared. That's x squared minus 2x minus 2x is minus 4x plus 4. And if I now multiply in the first bracket, I get x to the power of 3 minus 4x squared plus 4x plus 5x squared minus 20x plus 20. If I add up my like terms, my final answer is x to the power of 3 plus x squared minus 16x plus 20. Let's go see. Is my b value 1? Yes. My c negative 16? Yes. And my d 20. 4 marks. Where did the 4 marks go? The marks went for substituting in the 5, then for the 0, 20, and knowing you have a root that is repeating, for calculating that missing root, and then for multiplying out your brackets and getting to the final answer. Question 9.1.2. They ask me to calculate the coordinates of P and R. Why are they asking P and R? They are my turning points. Great. 12s, if you were struggling to get this, remember they've told you in question 9.1.1 that B is 1, C is negative 16, and D is 20. So please use that. So we now know GX is X to the power of 3 plus X squared minus 16X plus 20. How do I get the turning point? It's where the first derivative is equal to 0. So let's go get our first derivative. My first derivative, 3 times 1 is 3. x to the power of 3 minus 1 is 2. 2 times 1 is 2. x to the power of 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 times negative 16 is negative 16. x to the power of 1 minus 1 is 0. I can't differentiate 20. What do I know about this? It must be equal to 0. So 3x squared plus 2x minus 16 equal to 0. And that I can now factorize. Please remember, if you're struggling to factorize, you are welcome to use the quadratic formula. You just have to show your substitution. If I factorize this, 
my two brackets is 3x plus 8 and my other bracket is x minus 2 equal to 0, which means x is equal to negative 8 over 3 or x is equal to 2. Read your question again. It says calculate the coordinates of P and R. We've only got the x values. We must still get the y values. So I'm going to substitute back into the original. So I'm going to go, what if x was negative 8 over 3? What would I get? Negative 8 over 3 to the power of 3 plus negative 8 over 3 squared minus 16 times negative 8 over 3 plus 20. And y works out to be 1,372 over 27. Or if I substitute 2 into my equation, if I substitute in 2, I get it's 0. So if I go y equals 2 cubed plus 2 squared minus 16 times 2 plus 20, I get 0. So what are my two coordinates? P is the coordinate 2, 0, and R is the coordinate negative 8 over 3 and 1,372 over 27. And that counted three marks. Where do the three marks go? Sorry, that counted five marks. Where do the five marks go? For getting the first derivative, making it equal to 0 for factorizing it, and then for the coordinate of P and the coordinate of R. Question 9.1.3, they're asking me, is this graph concave up or concave down at 0, 20? Show all your calculations. Once again, grade 12s, there is a video on concave up and concave down, which you can go watch. How, what do I know about concave up or concave down? It's got to do with my second derivative. So let's go see. We have, in the previous question, we had our first derivative was equal to 3x squared plus 2x minus 16. So my second derivative, 3 times 6, 3 times 2 would be 6x, 1 times 2 is 2. That is my second derivative. So what do I know? There's two ways we can do this. We can say, okay, we can work out the point of inflection. What do I know about the point of inflection? It's where the second derivative is equal to 0. So that's where 6x plus 2 is equal to 0. So 6x is equal to negative 2 and x is equal to negative a third. They've asked me, what can I say about the coordinate 0, 20? So if you look at your graph, by x equals negative a third, I'm going to change my concavity. So, let's go look at our graph. Negative a third would be before zero. Before that, it is concave down. And after that, it is concave up. So, I can say this is greater than zero. So, it's concave up. The x is, the, sorry, I can say the first derivative is greater than zero. So, I can say it's concave up. The second way you could have done this is when you worked out your first, your second derivative of 6x plus 2, you could have gone and subbed in the what if x is 0. So if x is 0, what do I get? 6 times 0 plus 2, I get an answer of 2. Is this answer greater or smaller than 0? It's greater than 0. So the first derivative of 0 is greater than 0 which means this graph is concave up. Two ways to have done it. It's three marks. It's a mark for getting the second derivative, then a mark for working out the inflection point and telling me it's concave up. If you were use the second method, a mark for the second derivative, a mark for calculating that zero is great, the second derivative at zero is two, and then your conclusion that it's concave up. Our last question we're looking at grade 12 is the one from June 2019. And now you will see they have now, we're only going to look at question 5.2.5. And this question is now, they've asked me now this in the 
question regarding functions. This is not in the calculus section. This is in the function section of the paper. And they've given me all of this. And they said, if we look at 5.2.5, it is for, they've given you originally that kx is a parabola, ax to the power of 2 plus bx plus c, and hx is a straight line, negative 2x plus 4. The graph k has a turning point at negative 118. S is the x-intercept of H and K, and the graphs H and K also intersect at T. So we've gotten the sketch of a parabola and a straight line. Now by 5.2.5, they said, if it is further given that K, this parabola, is the graph of the first derivative of G, nowhere have they spoken about G before. So G is a cubic graph, and they're not telling you that K is actually the graph of its first derivative. For which values of x will the graph be concave up? So what do I know about concave up? It is where my first derivative will be increasing. So it's where the parabola is increasing. Where is the parabola increasing? For all the x values smaller than negative 1. And that was a two mark question. Two marks for the answer. By b... They're now asking you, sketch the graph of G. So that original cubic graph, showing clearly the x values of the turning points, as well as the points of inflection. So what do we know? If I now, they've given me the sketch of the first derivative, and I have to go sketch the original. So the x-intercepts of the parabola will be the turning points of my original graph. So do I know the x-intercepts of my parabola? Let's go and look. If I look at the parabola, I've got the coordinate s, which is the one x-intercept. The other one is not named. So how can I calculate the coordinate s? It's the x-intercept. I don't have the equation. But I do know it's the x-intercept of the straight line as well. So I can go calculate the x-intercept of the straight line. It's where negative 2x plus 4 is equal to 0. So negative 2x is negative 4. So where x is 2. So s is the coordinate 2, 0. So what is my other x-intercept? Without being able to calculate it, can I read it off? I have my one x-intercept now is 2, 0. I have the turning point of the parabola is at negative 1, 18. Remember, that's also the axis of symmetry. So however far right the one x-intercept is, so far left the other one must be. So if there's a three unit difference between negative one and two, the other x-intercept must be three units to the left. Negative one minus three would be negative four zero. Okay, what else do I know? The turning point of the parabola would become my original one, it would be the point of inflection, would be the point of inflection on the original. And what do I know? The turning point is at 1. So the point of, sorry, at negative 1. So the turning point is at, the point of inflection is at x equals negative 1. So now I've got to go draw this. This is all the information I have. Let's go decide what would my shape be. What is the a value? If you go look at this parabola, it's a sad parabola. Would the A value have been positive or negative? The A value would have been negative. So I know the shape would have to look like that. What do I know? So let's go put it down. I know that the x-intercepts of the parabola would be the turning points of the original. So what are the two turning points? At 2, 0 and at negative 4. So I'm going to have a turning point at negative 4. I'm going to have a turning point at 2. I know my point of inflection is at x equals negative 1. And I know my shape. So, I can go draw. My shape has to look like that. That has to be my point of inflection. And I have to turn by these. So, this is a rough sketch. I do not know what my y values is. I only know my x values. And that is how I would indicate it. 
Where would the marks go? The three marks. It would be a mark that you had the correct shape. A mark for the turning points indicated at x equals negative 4 and x equals 2. And then a mark for the point of inflection that x was negative 1. Grade 12s, there is a link to all the past papers at the bottom of this video that you are welcome to click on. And it will take you to the WCDE portal with all the past papers and memos. From me, Terine Cox, who's presenting the English lessons, and Elaine van der Merwe, who's presenting the Afrikaans, we wish you good luck, and remember the only way to learn mathematics is to do mathematics.